Welcome everyone. Thank you for coming to our February 1st school board meeting. This meeting is now in session. Would you all please rise for the presentation of the colors by the Career Center Air Force JROTC. Please be seated. They do such a beautiful job and they always walk out of the room before I get a chance to say that. Um, but we very much appreciate our cadets. They come to us at, at every meeting and perform that ceremony. Um, I do want to mention before we begin that our colleague Tanya Talento is on her way. She's the liaison to the Student Advisory Board. They have been meeting at other schools um, for their meeting locations, and so she's on her way here and, and will get here very soon. We are excited tonight to have two recognitions. First, we will recognize our teachers who have achieved National Board Certification. I'd like to introduce Carrie Hirsch, our Teacher Evaluation Specialist and Sue Sarber, Supervisor of Professional Learning, who will present this recognition. Before they begin, I would like to invite my board colleagues to join me in the first row so we can enjoy the recognition. Thank you. <laughs> yes, I got the memo. Uh, good evening, uh, Dr. Cannon and members of the school board, Dr. Murphy. We are really excited to be here tonight um, to recognize the hard work uh, and professional achievement of 43 Arlington teachers who have achieved the prestigious National Board certification from the National Board for Professional Teaching Standards as well as 14 Arlington teachers who have renewed their certificate um, uh, for National Board certification. This year, Arlington ranked first in the state of Virginia in the number of new National Board certified teachers, which is really quite a testament to the dedication of the teachers here in APS. These teachers successfully mastered a performance-based assessment that has taken them up to three years to complete. They've invested much time and effort with no guarantee that they would um, be granted certification. The National Board advances the quality of teaching and learning by developing professional standards for accomplished teaching. Creating and administering National Board certification and integrating certified teachers into national reform efforts. Like board certified doctors and accountants, 
teachers who achieve National Board certification have met rigorous criteria through intensive study, expert evaluation, self-assessment, and peer review. Today, over 118,000 National Board certified teachers are making a positive difference in the lives of students across the nation. More than a decade of research from across the country confirms that students taught by National Board certified teachers learn more than students taught by other teachers. <coughs> Estimates of the increase in learning are on the order of an additional one to two months of instruction, and the positive impact is even greater for high need students. Tonight, we have with us from the National Board for Professional Teaching Standards, Carol, Ka sorry, Carol Izell, Director of Psychometrics, and Andrea Hayek, Director of Assessment and Operations. If you could just stand. We thank you for being here. And we thank them for being here with us tonight to celebrate the hard work of our teachers. Including tonight's honorees, Arlington students are fortunate to have 190 National Board Certified Teachers in their midst. This represents approximately 7% of our teaching staff. Um, and Arlington is ranked second in the state of Virginia in the number of NBCTs that we have in our classrooms. Nationally, only about 3% of teachers hold this certification. So if any of our National Board Certified Teachers are here tonight to help recognize your colleagues, would you please stand? Let me turn your uh, okay. the podium so you can face. Oh, Sounds good. Thank you. <laughs> thank you all for being here tonight to help recognize this important accomplishment for your colleagues. Now on to tonight's honorees. Our newest National Board Certified Teachers are present here tonight and we will recognize them in alphabetical order. Um, each honoree will receive a certificate uh, commemorating this outstanding achievement. Uh, and we are grateful that every year the Arlington Education Association helps join us in recognizing the significant accomplishments of our new NBCTs. And so as a token of congratulations from your Arlington County instructional colleagues, um, in addition to your lovely Starbucks, inside you will find a lapel pin um, that recognizes you as an NBCT that's been provided by the AEA. So we'd like to thank um, Ms. Ingrid Gant as president of the AEA um, for <laughs> helping to recognize those teachers. So at this time, um, Dr. Sue Sarber and Dr. Murphy, uh, as well as members of the board in turn, will help us in um, handing out certificates to these teachers. And we'll start tonight with Ms. O'Grady. So if you Sue, do you want to the certificate here? Honorees, when I call your name, um, please come forward and receive your certificate and your pin. Um, and we can hold applause to the end. We have for, as I said, 43 um, uh, honorees, so it will help the process go a little bit smoother. Uh, so I'll ask you to come up and remain in the front until we have the full group assembled so that we can take a photo. So we'll begin. Uh, Katie Aiken from Barrett. Lisa Blanford, Williamsburg. Jeff Bunting, Yorktown. There we go. Jennifer Clark, Long Branch. Lori Clark from Jamestown couldn't be here with us this evening. Carolyn Crumpler, HB Woodlawn. She's not here this evening. Uh, Greg Daddario, Long Branch. Jennifer Dean, Washington Lee. Jane Faraday, Wakefield. Nora Garcia, Oak Ridge. <laughs> Megan Goidich, Long Branch. Amy Haley Swanson. Sorry, 
Diane Holland, Yorktown. I'll be slower. Might be. We'll get it to you after. Adam Who. Adam Who, Washington Lee. They're telling me to go slower, so if you'd like to clap in between, go for it. <laughs> Chanel Hoyer, McKinley. and Abby James, Arlington Science Focus. So at this time, we're going to switch. I'm gonna ask, ask Mr. Goldstein to come up and help us with our next um, set of certificates. Julie Kaufman, Barrett. Erin Koalevitz, Randolph. Nicholas Cuppins, Yorktown. Erica Larson, Washington Lee. Alex Lester, Washington Lee. Joanne Mann, Jefferson. Danielle Mascioli, in Nottingham. <laughs> Geraldine Mascaloni, Career Center. <laughs> and at this time, we're going to switch. I'm going to ask Ms. Van Doren to come up and help us with our next set of certificates. Melissa Meck, Swanson. <laughs> Tammy Metz, Swanson. <laughs> Pam Nagurka, Department of Teaching and Learning. <laughs> Ashley Neal, Arlington Tech. Robin Nugent, Yorktown. <laughs> Patricia Oviedo, Campbell. <laughs> Deborah Pettit, Wakefield. <laughs> Lila Plunkett, Hoffman, Boston. Haley Post, Williamsburg. And at this time, I would like to ask Dr. Cannon to come up and do our next set of certificates. Stacy Romero, Barrett. <laughs> Catherine Ross, Taylor. Caitlin Rochfort, Jefferson. Lynn Shelton, Wakefield. Allison Smith, H.B. Woodlawn. Megan Sorrell, Drew. <laughs> Tatiana Simons, Arlington Science Focus. Mm -hmm. 
Lauren Worley, Arlington Science Focus. <laughs> Megan Zelasco, Patrick Henry. <laughs> Elizabeth Zivick, Taylor. And so I'm going to ask them to stay up here for a second. And national board certified teachers are expected to continue to grow professionally so that they can continue to offer high quality instruction to our students. And so tonight we're also recognizing those teachers who renewed their national board certification. They've demonstrated their commitment to reflect on their practice. And so we're going to ask them to join us at the front of the room as well. Um, and Ms. Talento, would you like to come up? Um, we don't have certificates for them, but you just greet them. Elizabeth Espaccio, Barcroft. Uh, yeah, we'll switch out. We missed her group. Sorry. <laughs> Robin K. Hoffman, Boston. Liliana Maldonado Mendez, Washington Lee. Allison Owens Taylor. Brad Rankin Kenmore. Sharon Ruggieri, Arlington Community High School. Kara Saavedra, Yorktown. Jennifer Stacy, Patrick Henry. Robert Summers, Washington Lee. Rachel Tarr, Yorktown. Latanya Thomas, Kenmore. Kevin Trainer, McKinley. Chrissy Wiedemann, Yorktown. And there she goes. And Alexander Workman, Jefferson. So we would just like to congratulate all of you once again. This is an amazing accomplishment for such a large group of Arlington teachers. Yes, good photo. We'll take a photo. <laughs> Yes, we're going to do a quick group photo. you look over this way. Ready? Okay. Everybody look this way. Here we go. One, two, three. Hang on just one second. One, two, three. Hang on one more. So while they're finishing the pic, it's too loud. Yeah, it's not on. Oh well, that's right. Oh, we're done. Yeah. And the principals. Oh, thank you. You're gonna do that. Okay. I'll go back and do both. Perfect. So I was wondering how to get that in. All right. Is it loud enough? No. We would also just—I don't know if it's on. Is it on? Um, it's not on. Okay. okay. We would also just like to say thank you to all of the uh, family members who provided support as well as our um, colleagues and especially our principals and assistant principals uh, who have helped these teachers through the process.
And then lastly, um, I get the great pleasure of working with Carrie Hirsch every day, and I just want to acknowledge her for all the support and advocacy that she has done to you guys. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> you may return to your seats. Thank you again to the school board for uh, allowing us to recognize these teachers. You guys ready? Thank you. We just call us back to attention for those watching from home we had a very large crowd and it's taking a little while and apparently no one told them that we're recognizing the school board next because I'm sure they would have wanted to stay for the next item uh, we are very pleased tonight to have our CCPTA president Jen Bauer here who is going to present the next recognition thank you good evening Jen. Should I go get them all I could go bring them so, good evening. I am Jennifer Bauer, and I'm currently serving as the president of the Arlington County Council of PTAs. 
Tonight, I am joining you to offer an additional recognition that is a true honor for me. It is School Board Appreciation Month, and tonight we are recognizing our school board members. In what I have done since the beginning of my very short tenure as CCPTA president, there have been many tedious and time-consuming tasks where you wonder if you are really making that much of a difference. Meetings, emails, trying to interact with the representatives of roughly 30 parent-teacher organizations in Arlington County Schools while balancing job and family. It's a lot. So by virtue of doing this for just a half a year, I think I understand just a very small portion of what each of you have undertaken in your commitment to serving APS and our Arlington community by your public service on our school board. And I'm here tonight to tell you that on behalf of the Arlington community, we are so grateful. School board requires night meetings, work sessions, review of policies and decisions, pouring through dense financial budget, even construction documents. It requires vision and big picture thinking about where we want our school system to be in a decade, as well as empathy and attention to the minute details when one of your constituents, families, or students needs help in the moment. The scale of your service is frankly enormous, and it is probably often quite thankless, and perhaps you too sometimes wonder, am I really making much of a difference? Tonight, I am here to tell you, on behalf of the PTAs throughout Arlington, all the parents, teachers, and students, a resounding yes. You are representing us faithfully and tirelessly. You are making personal sacrifices to do so. And while you are in the thick of it, you may not see how much the community appreciates you, but please know that we do. Your strong leadership and decision-making benefit us all. I simply want to offer you the encouragement and recognition that you truly deserve for your service to our community. Governor Northam has recognized February as School Board Appreciation Month, stating that the leadership of our state school boards play an important role in our representative democracy, ensuring that our community's values are translated into providing a high quality public education for each student in Arlington is very much worth honoring and celebrating all year, but particularly this month. So tonight, I offer again our thanks and a special recognition to each of you Barbara, Monique, Nancy, Reed, and Tanya, I thank you for what you have done to be here and for the service to us all that your dedication and countless hours of hard work provides. So please join us down here to accept the certificates of appreciation and take a, a short picture. Appreciate it. Thank you for everyone who's sticking with us this evening. We are now at announcements. On Tuesday, February 6th, we will have a work session on the strategic plan at 7 p.m. In, in room 101. Thursday, February 8th, we will have a closed meeting at 6.30 p.m. in the school board conference room. And on Friday, February 9th, there will be a committee of the whole meeting at 8.30 a.m. in the school board conference room. 
uh, board colleagues, do you have any announcements this evening? Okay, Dr. Murphy. Thank you. All right, I've got a couple of announcements <clears throat> this evening, and uh, the first is we've just come off the uh, end of the second grading period and also the semester, so uh, families should be looking for uh, report cards coming home February the 6th. We've got secondary report cards on the 13th, elementary. Uh, we're going to celebrate President's Day here on February the 19th, and then I'll be bringing forward my proposed budget um, at, toward the end of February on the 22nd. February also is Black History Month, and there's going to be a number of events and activities occurring. Uh, what we kick off with here is uh, with our hashtag, APS Black History, and so uh, utilizing social media to promote many of the things that are happening in our schools. We're also going to recognize some models of excellence reflected in our students and celebrate also some of our alumni who are some of the trailblazers that maybe even grew up here in Arlington uh, and share some of their experiences here. Um, and I know we're going to be posting those on the web page. We have a superintendent seminar uh, with one of our parents who is a former George Mason University professor and now is at Columbia and uh, she's published several books and going to be talking a little bit about uh, equity in public education. And then our culminating event is on February the 28th and that's going to be looking at past and future excellence. This year Gunston Middle School is going to be hosting that and we've got our URL so we encourage folks to, uh, um, you know, go to the site, see the different resources that are available, and I know schools are doing a number of different things uh, throughout the month. We want to celebrate and recognize also our count, uh, counselors, and uh, that kicks off here on February the 5th, and I believe I saw Pam McClellan here, who uh, leads uh, our counseling team, so thank you for being here uh, this evening. We also have the hashtag NSCW18APS in recognition of our school counselors and the critical role they play in supporting students and what happens in our classrooms. We have the activities fair coming up uh, a week from tomorrow. That's Friday, February the 9th. I just want to remind everyone we've changed the location. Uh, it's going to be at Kenmore Middle School. So uh, you may want to kind of reorient. I know I've had to make a mental note in my mind. Uh, that kicks off at 6 a.m. Oh, at 6 p.m. rather to 8. And uh, it, you know, while there will be uh, things that the school is sponsoring, there will also be things county is sponsoring, and there'll be a number of different vendors who have camp opportunities for students. Uh, so it's a good chance to come out, see what is available, uh, and then families begin to look at some of their selections and choices. In the event we have some inclement weather, we do have a, a snow date of February the 16th. We also want to recognize our crossing guard with crossing guard appreciation, which is uh, right here in the middle of February. It's also Valentine's Day, and I do want to make a note, our crossing guard at uh, Ashlawn Elementary School was one of the uh, top crossing guards recognized last year here in Arlington Public Schools, so congratulations to her again. All right, we're going to do a short little segue now, and I'm going to turn to uh, Ms. Van Dorn, uh, who's got props there. So. Uh, <laughs> I had the class's attention with my props, and they're squishy <laughs> props, so you can visit the board office and find one if you are interested. Uh, I am the uh, liaison to the Joint Committee on Transportation Choices and the uh, Arlington Committee on Transportation Choices, which is a staff group and a community uh, advisory group on transportation, and we love the bus. So please, Dr. Murphy is going to give you some detail about Love the Bus Week, but I wanted to point out that there are materials on, our, on the website of Arlington Transportation Partners that all schools can use, lots of fun things that the schools can do and that parents can ask to cooperate with the schools to use stickers and all sorts of, of flyers and ways to celebrate and thanking the bus drivers for their, their great work and using the bus, bus as much as possible. So this is a staff site. And I know that Dr. Murphy is going to mention more, but the buses are a wonderful uh, service for, I think, about half of our students take buses, and we are really appreciative of all the work that they do. Thank you, Ms. Van Dorn. Uh, yes, and a good resource, and I know something as we continue to grow as a school division, something that we're encouraging, and also the collaboration um, with the, uh, the art buses as well. So let me share a couple of things um, with you if you are uh, not aware of that. Um, 
The first is that if your child is school bus eligible, be sure to let them ride the bus uh, during uh, Love the Bus Week. I know there's going to be a number of activities kind of associated with that. Um, I think it's a wonderful time also for children and families to recognize their bus driver uh, during this time and, you know, signs of appreciation not only for our bus drivers but for our crossing guards as we celebrate uh, them both during this uh, time period. Students in uh, K through 12 are also eligible for iRide smart cards uh, and the iRide smart cards give students a discount of a dollar. Uh, and they can ride those art buses 24-7 and those carts come to them at a half price or half rate. It's also a good way to begin to encourage independence of students uh, riding the bus or traveling throughout uh, Arlington uh, and the area. And then finally, I would encourage you to check out the list of transportation choices that are on the APS GO website. Um, I know I recently, uh, as a longtime Arlington resident, for the first time rode the art bus and I was really surprised of, at the accessibility and actually all art buses do in some way intersect or go by many of our schools within a half mile radius. So the availability of that uh, as well as our school buses we see as kind of a growing infrastructure to support us as we continue to also grow as a school division. All right, I'm going to transition now to uh, upcoming uh, Montessori uh, Information Night that is slated for Wednesday, February the 7th, and some of the activities that are going to be occurring on this evening. There's going to be two um, informative teacher-led panels that are going to discuss the choices with parents, and the topics include both the primary Montessori and the elementary Montessori. They're also going to be providing tours uh, throughout the building uh, for primary, lower elementary, and upper elementary Montessori, and this is going to be held at Drew Model School. Uh, we're really encouraging parents to come out and find out about the Montessori program, and we are going to also be offering babysitting and Spanish translation will be provided. So if families are interested in finding out a little bit more about this, uh, we look forward to seeing you on February the 7th. Coupled with that, we've got uh, pre-K registration also underway, uh, and that's now through Monday, April the 17th. Uh, and the program is open or, to children who turn three years old by September 30th, 2017. Uh, you can um, apply, uh, bring all required documents to the SciFX Education Center, uh, Welcome Center there. Uh, that's where we're going to have a central registration, and that's from 8 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. And we also have evening hours on Thursday from 8 a.m. to 7.30. If you've got questions, you can go to the website. There's a URL there. Uh, early childhood would be the area that you would want to look. And there's also information both here on the slide uh, as well on the website where you can reach out uh, by phone and talk to members of our staff. Coupled with that, we also have... Um, kindergarten registration that is going on during the same time period. Uh, ele elementary options applications forms are now online, but if families need assistance or translation with uh, the different documents, they can either go to the APS Welcome Center there at SciFax or they can go to their local school and there will be support systems there that will be able to help them. You're going to hear a little bit later tonight uh, an act on summer school registration. Uh, after the board takes action on this item, we will go ahead and post uh, the APS catalog online tomorrow so families can also begin to sort of digest the different things that are available. Uh, this information will also be uh, available at the uh, activities fair that's coming up uh, a week from tomorrow. Uh, I do want to make a note that the deadlines vary here for the various programs, so throughout the spring what I do is I try and highlight some of the deadlines that are coming up and give families a little bit of an advance notice. We encourage students of APS currently that they can register at their home school. Non-APS students currently can go to the summer school office, which is located there at the SciFax building. And much of this information tomorrow morning, uh, bright and early, will be posted online so you can go to the URL there and find out a little bit more about that. Uh, our collaboration with the Arlington Partnership for Children, Youth, and Families, uh, we are calling for uh, nominations of exceptional people, groups, or businesses 
for its Connect with Kids Champion Award. And we recognize those individuals here, as well as I know the county board does. So if you know someone who does some exceptional things uh, for young people, they might be a teacher, an assistant, or bus driver, cafeteria worker, custodian, or maybe a youth program leader, coach, or other volunteer, this is a great way to thank them. And we want to thank the partnership also for their role in sponsoring this. All right, we continue to see uh, that um, you know, uh, illness uh, is um, a bit prevalent, especially with uh, the, the colder weather that we're experiencing right now. So encouraging you know, children and all of us to wash our hands, cover up when we cough. If we're not feeling well, the best advice is to stay home. Uh, I read something last week. The best thing that you can do, I understand, is periodically throughout the day, just wash your hands. Uh, it's the best um, kind of medicine or approach. And I would also couple that with make sure you get plenty of sleep. And then finally, uh, we are still in that season of the possibility of inclement weather. So I just want to remind families that we're watching the weather very closely. Mr. Chadwick has kindly reminded me he will probably be calling me tomorrow morning at about 4 a.m., but hopefully we'll have a repeat of what happened on Tuesday and uh, not experience any inclement weather. But uh, just some times there to be avail uh, aware of. We try and make decisions as early as possible. If we're going to do an early, uh, early dismissal, we'll try and get an announcement out by 11 a.m. And you can see the various channels that information is also available. And we do provide it in both English and Spanish. That's all I got. Thank you, Dr. Murphy. Uh, we are now ready to act on our consent agenda. May I have a motion to accept the consent agenda? So moved. Is there a second? A second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes five to zero. And I would like to share that under consent, we just appointed additional members to the Reed Building Level Planning Committee. We also accepted a briefing report. It looks like this. It is on board docs. Um, it is on academic support for students from pre-K to grade 12. I want to thank the Department of Teaching and Learning. And I think there are some contributors to the report back there. Thank you so much for your great work. Um, and uh, this. This covers topics that are of very great interest to the board. We had some um, robust discussion about counseling, uh, psychological services, and things at our recent ACI work session. And um, we know we're going to continue work going forward with you all working on those things. Thank you so much for your great work. Uh, because we have a little time before we, are, we can do non-agenda comments, if, if board colleagues want to make any comments at this moment, I'll open it up. Ms. Tolento. Thank you, Madam Chair. First, I want to apologize for being late this evening. Um, I am the liaison of the Student Advisory Board, and I have missed their last two meetings due to school board meeting obligations. So I took today to go sit with them. They're an amazing group. For those of you who are not aware of our Student Advisory Board, they are high school students from all of our high schools and programs. Um, they meet once a month, um, sometimes more often, to discuss concerns that they have. And the board meets with them every quarter. So they're a great group of students. Some of them are serving as liaisons to our committees in the community. It was a wonderful meeting. So I do apologize for being late. And I did want to also um, encourage our community to read the academic support briefing. The information in that briefing was phenomenal. The amount of resources that we have for our families um, and our students in the schools is really, really great. And I, I commend the staff for doing all the work. Um, and I think it's important for our families to know what we are trying to do in our schools to help our students uh, be prepared to learn and, and, and manage their daily life. So thank you for that. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Um, you all are here, so you know that we have an earlier start time than we have traditionally in the past. You made it. Um, however, when we decided at the beginning of the year to start our meetings earlier, and of course this gets us to end earlier and um, allow folks to go home at a decent hour in the evening, when we decided to move to an earlier start time, we were concerned that parents might have um, trouble getting here in time to make comments. And so we set a rule that you probably saw prominently displayed for those of you who signed up for comments, that we would not start that um, period until 7 p.m. That ensures that anyone watching at home knows what time to you know, turn their TV on. It also ensures, again, that folks can get here in time if, if they have trouble getting out of work. So. Since we have an extra 15 minutes before turning to that, what I would like to do is 
turn to what I think will be our a short, the shorter of the two monitoring, monitoring items we have, which is the security update. Um, if that would work, Dr. Murphy, could we, um, could we go to the security update? And from there, we will do non-agenda comments. Absolutely. Okay. I know uh, Mr. Reardon is here. I thought we were going to go another direction, but this, this, this will work as well. Yeah. So as Mr. Reardon makes his way here, I will just uh, do a brief introduction here. We annually bring a series of different reports to the board, either through the briefs or through uh, uh, presentations. Uh, one of the ones that uh, we, uh, you know, do re pretty regularly as a, a presentation that we want to keep our community aware of is um, the safety measures that we take uh, on a regular basis and security measures to ensure that our students are safe, our staff is safe, and that we maintain that uh, good relationship uh, with all of our community members. So with that as a little bit of a backdrop, we'll turn to Mr. Reardon. He's our security coordinator and he's got a variety of different aspects of our security uh, plan that he'd like to share with you this evening. Mr. Reardon. Thank you. Good evening. Just to let you know, uh, if I haven't met you, and there's a couple I haven't, I came here from the police department. Uh, I spent 27 years with Arlington County Police Department before I retired and joined the school system. I left one there one day and was here the next. And uh, so for those of you I haven't met before, uh, just to let you know my background a little bit, I'm going to touch on a number of projects that we're working on. Uh, you're going to note that you may have heard about some of these before. Many of these projects are multi-year projects as we work through the school system. Uh, I also want to point out right from the beginning as I touch on them, uh, the many other uh, departments in public schools that are uh, assisting in these measures and even the agencies outside Arlington Public Schools that contribute to it. So again, let me get started. Oh, here we go. Keeping students safe through our security measures. Uh, there we go. And our, our goals here are to provide for the safety and security of all our students, staff, and visitors. And we do this through coordination with all government agencies in order to enhance their safety and security. Emergency management is one of the first things and security touches upon that. We have a district-wide emergency management plan. Uh, this is something that we review every year. Uh, we bring in uh, numerous agencies from the county, police, fire, public health, to go through it. One of the things we like to do is, if we've used any portion of it that year, is to sort of test it and say, gee, did it work? Didn't it work? How can we do that better? And so that if we have a in similar incident in the future, we can apply those lessons learned. Uh, throughout the year, students and staff participate in state mandated fire drills and lockdowns. Uh, I believe right now it's four of each during the year, two in the first 20 days, so that uh, they're familiar with what happens in a situation like that. Uh, as I already mentioned, we collaborate with county agencies. In this case, the uh, issues related to public safety communications emergency management are touched upon and we consult with them routinely. In fact, we participate in exercises with the county, state, and federal agencies. Uh, just last week, uh, a number of administrators participated in an exercise with the county emergency, uh, or I'm sorry, the upper, uh, Office of Emergency Management in an incident command exercise. Uh, about a month before that, there was an exercise in which Arlington Public Schools, along with a number of private and uh, public agencies, participated in a tabletop put on by the uh, by FEMA and uh, that took place in one of the hotels here. So any chance we get to work with those other agencies, we take advantage of it. One of the things we do, Virginia Department of Criminal Justice Services requires a yearly audit of schools uh, and that is an online audit that uh, Ms. Johnson oversees for the staff uh, it also involves every three years a physical audit of our schools. And so in a case like that, we do a physical inspection of every school. We note any deficiencies and uh, we document everything for follow-up. One of the things you think of first when you think about school security and safety is our SROs. Uh, we have an MOU with the 
Harlan County Police Department. Uh, they're currently working on a new one. The S. Rose in our schools uh, obviously project security in our schools, but in addition to that, they help build connections with the students and staff and build relationships. They help us collaborate on school issues, school security issues. Uh, they help under our students understand the legal implications of what they may be doing. They also are forefront in the training of our staff and guiding them in issues related to security at the schools. School radio communications is something, again, one of those projects we've been working on for a number of, number of years. Uh, construction new schools, renovation of schools has uh, brought that to the forefront because as we do these renovations and these new, the new construction, we find that radio signals are blocked. They're blocked by concrete, foil insulation, steel, and probably the worst offender is the low E glass because it blocks the radio signals and can block telephone signals. So one of the things we work on with the county is to ensure we have 100% communications for our first responders who operate on an 800 megahertz radio system uh, by installing distributed antenna systems in our schools, new and renovated schools. In addition, we have identified uh, other schools in which there were communication gaps and we're working with the county to address those. Now I mentioned distributed antenna systems and uh, it's easy to say, what the heck is that? This quick slide uh, hopefully will give you an idea. Distributed antenna system is basically we build an antenna system inside the school. It goes to an amplifier, which goes to an antenna on the building, and that's how the radio signal gets out. And the reverse is true if an officer or fireman is inside the school, that's how the signal gets back to them. And uh, this is the list of schools, and it's getting longer, that have a distributed antenna system. Uh, facilities maintains that with yearly checks as well as the initial sign-offs with the county. I've got to say that uh, the county staff and uh, their IT department oversees these and uh, we work well together and uh, we make sure it happens. In many of the schools, uh, we have a communications problem and have addressed it by upgrading to 800 megahertz radios. And the key there is it is able to utilize that antenna system we just put in. That's been done in collaboration with the county. Many of the radios we use actually came from the county. They donated to us to help improve school security. It, it uses the DAS, it gives us 100% communication. It actually provides in an emergency school to school communications. Uh, and uh, in an emergency, the county communication center could actually come up on the radio of that particular school and talk directly to them. I just had a conversation last week with the director of the emergency communication center about taste testing that capability to ensure it's there. And we'll be following up on that. The other part of school, uh, school radio communications is our uh, elementary schools, which basically utilize VHF, very high frequency, and the two are not compatible. So what we've been doing at the uh, elementary school level is going through replacing old VHF radios with newer digital radios. Uh, we're, we're installing radio repeaters. And what that does is uh, a portable is only a few watts. And so they don't make it from one end of the school grounds to the other. This repeater basically takes the signal, rebroadcasts it at 50 watts. So they have complete communications there. Uh, we just did, uh, <laughs> Abington and uh, reports are that the radios work everywhere in the school now. Um, we are in the process right now, the POs have been cut to do McKinley and of all things the outdoor lab. Uh, the other part of that is uh, that we didn't have before was extended day couldn't talk to the school administrators. And so as part of this repeater project, they each get their channel, but to talk to each other is just one click and they're able to do that, which again, if there's an emergency in the school, they can better address it. Cameras are first responders. We currently have an MOU with the uh, Office for Emergency Management to be able to view the cameras that we have in the schools. <coughs> this is something, a collaboration between us and the county, uh, in particular, our IT department and their IT department worked very hard to make this possible. And what it does is, in an emergency, it allows real-time information to be given to our first responders. So that even before 
They are on the scene. They can hear what's going on and know what's going on. Our communication center is the only one we know of in this region that can actually bring up cameras in a school immediately to help direct the response. Uh, we've had a number of demonstrated successes in this, and just to give you an example, a few months ago, they had an alarm at Williamsburg at about 2 o'clock in the morning. And unfortunately, most alarms are false, probably 99.5%. Uh, in this case, ECC brought up the cameras at Williamsburg at 2 o'clock in the morning, and there's two guys dressed all in black walking down the hallway. Now, normally they would only have a couple of officers respond to a alarm call. In this case, they were able to immediately know that they need more resources and send additional officers. Uh, and they've had several other similar incidents like that where they're able to do that. Now, they, there's an MOU that we have with them. They can only access these cameras for emergencies, and that's a police or fire response. Uh, and they are permitted evenings, late evenings and weekends to do it for training so that their staff can actually capably manage them if there was an emergency. For our SROs in the school, and this is, uh, that's Officer Bellow at uh, Gunston. I have to took a second from the back there. Uh, all of our SROs in the high schools and middle schools have an SRO workstation. They're able to see all the cameras in their school live. So we're not, we don't want to discourage them from walking around, obviously, but if they're in there doing a report or something, they can glance up and see what's going on. It allows them that real-time monitoring, situational awareness. The cameras are recording. We keep approximately 10 days of stored video, so if something happens in the school, they can go back. It provides us an objective record of what happened. Uh, it prevents bullying by capturing some of that on uh, our tape and being able to go back and see it and address it. It monitors visitors. Uh, just the other day, someone said they had someone walking around and they didn't know who they were. They were able to go back, look at the video, print out a still, and ask around and find out who the person was and were they authorized to be in there. Uh, it deters vandalism, uh, excuse me, I'm trying to talk fast here, Ta deters vandalism and theft in the school, allows us to address those. It's also an investigative tool if something happens in the school and administrators need to look into it, it provides guidance as to who may have been involved. Ongoing upgrades to the security camera network. We've replaced all of our older cameras uh, from three years ago. We're currently, well, I shouldn't say currently, since I've been here, we've been installing additional cameras. Uh, it's included in the renovation of any school and any new school construction. Uh, in the case uh, just Today, I was at Jefferson because we've completed the survey there and are about to put in cameras. Jefferson is being funded uh, partially, and in fact, 75% of it, through a, a grant through Virginia DOE. Uh, the number of cameras in our schools in the last three years has doubled, and I will tell you that uh, administrators have found them very helpful uh, in addressing a number of problems in the school and continue to request uh, additional cameras. Another thing we're starting to work on is the visitor management system. One of the things we face is that if a visitor goes to one of our schools, each school has a different check-in system. If you went to three schools, three totally different systems that work differently. So we're working to address that by installing a single vendor visitor management system in all our schools. It allows us to accurately see who's visiting the school and keep a log. It'll speed in the check-in procedure. It'll give us system-wide standardization. Uh, it also is a system that allows us to add modules to it. So we're going to use it in its very basic uh, configuration, but in the future, should we want to do more with it, we have that ability. It's the same system that Fairfax County is going to for all their schools. We've done a limited pilot at five of our schools with good results, and we can hope to evaluate it and uh, continue the expansion to additional schools. Cameras and buses. Seems like I talk a lot about cameras. Uh, this is something that improves our student safety, uh, deters vandalism, enforces good driving practices, provides an objective record of incidents uh, for display problems, lawsuits, complaints, investigations. Uh, as you drive around Arlington, we found that 
our buses devote more and more time to safely operating their vehicles, which unfortunately they can't always see what's going on in a bus. So we have the ability if something's reported to go back and look and address an issue if it takes place. Status of cameras on IPS buses, and this is sort of a, a, a nice one. Three years ago, only 50% of our buses had a camera on it. Three years ago, most buses only had one camera in the front pointing back. Currently, our bus, 100% of our buses have cameras on them. Every bus has at least three cameras, uh, and our new buses come with a five camera system, and that's standardized for all our new buses. Another project that, uh, and again, this is something that we work closely with both the police department and the treasurer's office on, is our school bus stop arm cameras. I noticed the ones on the podium earlier, none of them had school bus stop arm cameras. Uh, but uh, we, we'll try and address that. Uh, <laughs> this is something that, uh, these type of accidents don't happen often, but when they do, they're very severe. The Commonwealth of Virginia allows the use of stop arm cameras. It requires a local ordinance, which we have, and allows an outside vendor, which we use. There's no cost to the school system for these stop arm cameras. <coughs> By using the vendor, they supply the equipment and get a percentage of the revenue. Arlington Public Schools was only the second school district in the state to place these on buses. Uh, a number of others have followed. In fact, we are in contact with them uh, routinely because they look to us for guidance on how to do that. Uh, and a number in this region are about to start. If you're not familiar with them, that's a good thing. That means you probably didn't get one of those violations in the mail. Uh, it's a camera on the outside of the bus. It activates when the stop arm is out, and it takes a picture and video. It notes uh, where you're at, so there's no question. There's another shot. They're automated, all lighting conditions, both directions, multi-lane, wireless downloads when they come back, captures GPS, date, time, relevant information, <coughs> The biggest thing is the video, because often I get a call from somebody that says, well, you know, wait a minute, that arm didn't go out until I was already two-thirds of the way through. Well, you click on the video, and uh, it's a lot different than a still shot. You can actually see people approach the bus and drive past the arm, and that's what's shown in court if they can test their ticket. This slide sort of gives you a, a better update of where we're at since the beginning of school this year. The Arlington County Police Department has approved 630 violations for drivers passing a stop school bus. We have cameras on only 20 of our buses. So you can see that this is a problem. This is also, this program also allows the, the police to use their resources other ways. They used to follow buses in order to get a violation. That's a very difficult thing. Uh, this has made that job much easier. To date, we've, uh, since this year, I should say, this school year, we've collected over $116,000 in fines. And there's a couple of charts there that sort of give you some background on where the most violations take place. Uh, sort of the interesting one is on the far left because most people, once they get a ticket, don't get a second ticket, and that's a good thing. That means hopefully they're learning and uh, it'll make our students safer uh, as they're coming to and from school. You'll also note where most of the violations come from. Many people think it's people cutting through the county on their way to DC from somewhere else, and you can see 45% of those violations are actually Arlington residents, so. Key takeaways, I, I'm already to the end. I told you I'd be as quick as I could. We consider security and safety to be critical to our students and staff. We're continuing to make investments in these areas. We want to make our staff and students as safe as possible. We utilize new technology wherever, wherever we can. And again, we collaborate with county uh, agencies whenever possible to enhance our ability to do that. We'll continue our multi-year safety and security improvements. We use new technology where possible. And we'll continue to work with the county, the state, and other agencies to enhance safety and security here at the schools. Thank you very much. Thanks for um, um, jumping up when I sort of announced you out of out of order. That's okay. Really appreciate it's, that very much, um, Ms. Elliott. Do we have any speakers on this item? I know. Again, we've we've got speakers um, that we are going to get back to in a moment. But let's just see if we have any questions or comments on this item, board colleagues. 
Let's go with Ms. Talento. Thank you for the presentation. I really appreciated all the, the information you provided. Uh, I have two questions. Sure. My first question is if you could um, talk a little bit about the lockdown drills that we do. Uh, I know that um, there's a what kinds of incidents our students are actually practicing for in the drills. Okay, and sure. Just to uh, provide uh, some background for the question is I've been reading. Um, it's unfortunate that we are having school shootings in the country right now, but what I've been reading in the most recent reports is that the students are um, reacting in the way that they have practiced, and it has really minimized uh, fatalities and injuries. And I'm curious, do our lockdown drills cover that in being mm -hmm. in, the, in an area? So I wanted to get some Sure, back and you're that. absolutely right. Anytime you practice something in an emergency, you'll do better, and so, uh, here there are, for lockdown drills, there are four, two required in the first 20 days. Now, you mentioned an active shooter. Uh, a lockdown drill is sort of uniform for any threat, including that, to staff right. or students. So in the case of a, lock, of a lockdown drill, they would put out the appropriate placard, secure their classroom, turn out the lights, pull down the blinds, turn off their communications devices, and be quiet. And that's for any threat to life uh, that's, uh, that takes place, whether it be an active shooter or something else. Thank you, that's very helpful. I, I know that my daughter would come home and say we had a lockdown drill and when I read this update, I realized, you know, I don't know if I really know what the details are of that, so I appreciate that. And then my second question is, do we have a timeline for when um, our radio communications will <coughs> be addressed at all of our schools? I know we're not, or my understanding is we're not at 100% at every school. Yeah. There are actually, that's a two-part question because we operate two radio systems. Um, the 800 megahertz is the public safety network, and that is something we've been working on for probably three years also. Uh, that includes, requires that DAS that we talked about. Uh, and this past year, we put a distributed antenna system in Kenmore and in Williamsburg. And as we address these, it's those schools that have been identified with the most serious problem. And that's not to alarm you, the problem is not that severe. It's what generally happens is uh, an area that's below grade or something like that. Uh, in, in fact, at Williamsburg, the system only covers the lower level of Williamsburg because the upper system is absolutely fine. So we've done those two schools. We go back and check the existing schools to make sure they're maintained. And next in line is Gunston and Jefferson. Jefferson will be done in conjunction with Fleet Elementary School because the system will support both, though we have no reported problems at Jefferson. And uh, Gunston is scheduled for later this year. Uh, one of the things that's worked out very well, um, I got a call from the, uh, from the county and. They said, well, how do you know the antenna system's working well? Uh, because we want to be sure when police and fire come that the radios work. Right? And I just sort of laugh because we're using 800 megahertz radios in those schools. And so if the antenna system doesn't work, trust me, I get a call that uh, the radios aren't working in our school. So we actually have sort of a built-in check to make sure that they're working properly. Now the VHF radios, again, at the elementary school level, we have some problems, minor. Uh, we're currently addressing that uh, as fast as we can by the installation of repeaters. Uh, we also found out because we're using repeaters takes more radio frequencies because you receive on one and transmit it on another, we needed additional frequencies. Just two weeks ago, we were granted additional VHF licensed frequencies by the FCC to help address that problem. Uh, like I said earlier, the PO for Outdoor Lab and um, McKinley just cleared, and so I expect that will be done in the next month, and it, it just is a continuing process. Uh, uh, I do this in conjunction with Extended Day, uh, something that wasn't done in the past so that we can also improve their radio communications. We're putting them on the same repeater, uh, we're giving them the chance to be able to talk back and forth to administrators, and they are more than happy to work with me on that and uh, understand that even after school we want, you know, we want good communications. Ms. Van Doren. 
I had two questions, now, now I have three, because uh -oh. I need closure. Did you catch the guys? I'm sorry? The two guys in Williamsburg, I need to know. You just said you found them and you saw them and you sent people, so did you catch them? <laughs> we did not catch them. Ah, I, I okay. have to say that, and I was, I was as disappointed as you were. <laughs> I heard this and I was like, oh great. Uh, unfortunately, is, and Williamsburg is a large school yes. and has a lot of doors. And uh, I don't know what happened, whether it was the first couple of officers on the scene or something, but they went out the back and got away. Well, but next that's, time. But I mean, that's a very good example, though, of things that have happened. Um, and uh, you know, I think uh, in the future I'll try and document some more for you because I think it's, it's, while these are very minor, it actually shows a great capability for our communication center to bring up those cameras and be able to see in the schools in an emergency. That's and, great. And, and, and I think there was an inquiry about what an emergency is. And we actually have an MOU, a three-page MOU, with the police department, or I shouldn't say police department, with the Office for Emergency Management that covers access to the cameras. And I will tell you, it's very restrictive. They can only access the cameras for an emergency, which is a police or fire response. If they access the cameras, they have to report back to us that they have so that we can review the incident. And in three years, I'm, I don't recall a single incident where the Office for Emergency Management accessed our cameras inappropriately. Great, and that was my second question, oh, because good. with the ability to access the cameras comes the um, responsibility of doing that. And I know that our parents would be concerned about how much people are observing their, their students. Uh, it's understandable for school staff, but you're going outside of that, but you've just answered that question, so you, you read my mind. I'm glad. But the third question I have connects um, somewhat to the first, in that you can have all the physical security in the world, but you really need people trained to use what you've put in the schools. Um, years ago, we had great locks, but people prop doors open. You can have cameras that get blocked because people put something over them. You can have you know, cameras that don't work. Uh, th there are lots of ways that that can n not work. So what kind of systematic training do we have so that people understand how to use the, the devices so that they're used well in the schools? Okay, you tricked me. There's about three questions there. So I'm going to try. It I'm has try, to do I'm, with training regarding. Yes, it's yes. not just about well, first the cameras of all, in, ter in, ter in terms the of the people. doors, you know, we work hard to keep our schools secure. All, all doors are supposed to be locked. If we find a door unlocked, uh, then that's information I would take up with Ms. Johnson and she would speak with uh, the principal at that school. Uh, they remain locked at all times. Uh, that's our first line of defense, so to speak. Anytime you talk about security, the more layers you have, the more effective it is. And so that, in fact, is one of our layers and we work hard on that. Um, we've added a number of uh, access control uh, doors uh, many of the schools, I think three in the last year, Randolph, Career Center, and Yorktown, we've rekeyed all the exterior doors to ensure that only a few people had keys in case they were lost or stolen and relying more on access control because we think that makes it a more secure environment. Uh, as for the training, the first part of training, most of our training is provided to staff by the SROs and that is worked on with Ms. Johnson, so uh, I, she may be able to address that better. I do some training with the staff. I've done a couple of tabletops when I'm on incidents, but that's the extent of it that I do. I think that uh, the more, I, as in the area of security and safety, I think the more uh, you do, both in uh, addressing these things with physical security and training, the better you get. I think we're, uh, I don't think we're there, but we've made great progress over the last three or four years in getting there. Okay, uh, Dr. Murphy, I don't know if Ms. Johnson wants to comment, but the training really, I think, is important because I know we've come a long way, but remembering to use the swipe cards, not letting strangers in the building, making having people sign in, all of those are practices that's using the devices, but it requires training and consistent use. I remember at one point we were having an issue with people not wanting to wear their badges, and then we got over that. There are a whole lot of things that have to do with training, and I'm just wondering how that's going. Ms. Johnson, do you want to speak to some of the things that we uh, have in place? 
Well, I, I do think um, Ms. Van Dorn touched on quite a few of them. I think it's uh, an ongoing process that we have to constantly review and we have to have some checks and balances. So when you talk about the swipe cards and, you know, prompting the doors, those are the things that we remind people is part of our safety protocol. So I think from the very onset, we want to remind ourselves that safety is always in the forefront of our mind. And so we do take steps to ensure that people are getting the right message. And in the work that we do, that's an ongoing process. I know that Dr. Murphy puts out messages regularly about safety, whether it has to do with preparing for the beginning of the school year, or it has to do with the weather, or it has to do with some kind of incident that does occur. But as far as the training, we have our emergency management preparedness book, and at the very beginning of the year, every administrator and staff member receives that. There's an expectation that everyone is trained and becomes familiar with that document. And then as we mentioned earlier, um, as Kevin mentioned earlier, there are ongoing practices throughout the year, um, um, specifically around certain um, drills, the fire drills, of course, the lockdown drills. We do follow the state directive when it comes to the tornado and earthquake. So that has become part of our protocol and our procedures for training. It's probably equally important to remember that whenever we have any kind of an emergency that does in fact occur, it is important to debrief after that incident occurs. So each school does also have a crisis management team that involves staff members, counselors, the police department, and we take advantage of those opportunities as well to kind of reflect on how an incident was managed and to improve on those practices. So that's another element of training as well. So it's very much a tiered approach and it's ongoing. Thank you, and I, I'll just, we'll do a follow-up later, but I'm more interested in the day-to-day, -day, everyday kind of security practices that a school has in place in terms of their normal operations and then also the communication to the students and to the families to participate in that. So. I'll follow up on that. We don't have to go into it more, but that's really what I'm, I'm interested in, the human beings who are making sure our students are safe and that we're all on the same page. Okay. Uh, I, don't, I, don't know, I don't know if one of you want to elaborate on a, 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 for instance, of a secure the building when there's an event that occurs in the community and the process that we go through with the secure the building and communicating with parents and also what staff does. I think that's a okay. perfect example of maybe something that Ms. Van Dorn is really questioning about. You asked earlier about a lockdown and the lockdown drills, and one thing I'll touch on is when uh, a lockdown drill takes place, it's coordinated with the police department, so they actually come in and make sure that the school, uh, that uh, our staff is doing appropriately and note any places that are deficiencies so they can be addressed. Uh, the other major, uh, generally you hear lockdown, and unfortunately sometimes it's misused on TV or on the radio, uh, the next is secure the building. And so we're very often a jurisdiction, they're actually at secure the building, uh, but the news media reports is a lockdown. A lockdown is everyone in their classroom, uh, no one leaves, the door's secure, the lights out, everything. Uh, a lesser of that is secure the building. And what happens is if there is a, even a possible threat outside the school building, say for instance, uh, a bank robbery took place near a school and they don't know where the suspect is, uh, a school may go to secure the building, which merely means that anyone outside will be brought inside, staff and students will remain in the, stu in the school, the doors will be secured and visitors will not be allowed in. Uh, until the police have cleared the area. There are some, I have to say, we're, we're lucky enough that we work so well with the Arlington County Police Department that very often in an instance like that, in order to allow buses to depart or buses to arrive, they'll actually post an officer to oversee it if we're insecure of the building so that dis the operations aren't totally disrupted. But that's another way that we ensure and then messaging goes out to the parents and I'll let Ms. Johnson, pick it up from there. Yeah, I think that's an important piece. And we work very closely with the Office of School and Community Relations to try to ensure that a message goes out to our parent community when any kind of incident occurs in within close proximity to a school. And so those messages can actually be tailored and they go out through APS talk. So 
that's one way in which we inform parents. Okay. Uh, Mr. Goldstein. Oh, yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Kevin. Um, it's a good presentation. I got two quick questions for you. Um, you were talking about that hardware, the distributed antenna system and the 800 megahertz radios and the other uh, VHF radios. And, you know, thinking about this from a budget perspective, I'm wondering, uh, what's the life uh, on that hardware and, and that technology? Because, you know, technologies fall away and yes. these technologies come forward and, of course, you, then you got to spend more money on those. So, it, you know, if you can kind of look down the road and estimate this. Is there anything in the past that we know, you know, this radio lasted for this long and then the new technology overtook it and then another technology overtook that? It's VHF, UHF, 800 are here to stay. Uh, 800 is the best radio frequencies to use and that's why police and fire use them. Um, and that technology, while radio equipment goes through cycles and improves, generally, Usually the lifespan is seven to eight years. Um, the equipment we're using, for instance, at the elementary school le level, the VHF radios, one of the things we're addressing is that there would never was a program to maintain and even upgrade them. So we're now doing that. Uh, and then also as part of that, doing maintenance on them to make sure that they're, uh, you know, they're gonna be operable. And so, uh, you know, I think any, any hardware that's true, I think it doesn't happen quite as much with the radio systems. And uh, since the 800 are working off the county's network, we don't have that burden, which is the, the larger one of maintaining. Gotcha, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so my second question is, going to the school bus uh, stop arm cameras, mm -hmm. you had a map about uh, an area of the county where we had the most violators and it was right there on the county line. Yes. Do you have a guesstimate as to why that spot is kind of the site of so many violations? We have cameras on 20 buses and we actually make a point of spreading them around the county and not concentrating on any one area uh, for a number of reasons. And, and one is we don't want people passing a school bus anywhere. And so you never know where they are. In fact, we uh, have five buses that have camera pods that don't work, that we picked up as decoys so that uh, our bus drivers actually told us they saw people sort of hesitate and they thought they were realizing they didn't have a camera on them and going by. And so we're actually the only school system in the state that actually has decoy pods on their buses to try, to try and help uh, encourage people to stop. Uh, that particular end of the pike, very often if you look at those spots, it has a lot, of do, lot to do with the road construction. Um, generally, we get more violations on uh, double lane highways. Um, and the west end of Columbia Pike there is, fits that bill. And if you look at a couple of the other spots, they tend to, uh, the people in that lane want to stop. And what happens is the people in the opposing lane either choose not to or aren't familiar with the law and uh, continue on by. And the law is very, the Virginia law uh, states that there has to be a raised median between lanes, otherwise you're required to stop for a bus. And uh, I, I think that's a lot of it. If you look at those hot spots, it has a great deal to do with uh, where the buses are stopping and picking up. I think also there's a lot of stops in that area. Um, there's a lot of high rises uh, and the density increases the number of buses in that part of the county. I think that also adds to it. Okay. Thank you. Thanks very much. Mr. Grady, yes. I, we use the acronym SRO a lot, but I don't know if every parent knows what that means, so I just wanted to... Sure. S SRO is school resource officer. Yeah, I, I can honestly say I literally talk to them every day. Uh, for something at the school. I mean, it's sort of, uh, Ms. Johnson is the official liaison and so the policy issues go through her, but uh, very often they alert me to things that need to be addressed in the school, security, uh, physical security, whatever it might be, parking issues, uh, do not enter signs or something else. And we find that, you know, we're able to uh, address whatever they raise very quickly that way. And, uh, you know, I have to say that 
having come from the police department, I'm a little biased, but I think uh, we have some very fine SROs. They do a great job uh, keeping our school safe and also working with our students. And I just wanted to quickly reiterate that it would be great, another great reason to sign up for School Talk is because if there is a message like this um, that might impact when your child comes home on the bus, it's good to be um, signed up um, for School Talk to, to hear if there's any uh, issues in your school that might impact when your child would come home because a bus might be delayed. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, much Mr. Reardon. Last um, chance. It's nice to see your program, you know, ex uh, thriving. And, uh, you know, since we've watched over the years to see the, the things that you're up to. So really terrific work. Thank you very much. Good night. Yes. Um, we will now go uh, back to our citizen comment on non-agenda items. So thank you all um, for your patience. And I will begin first by reading the speaker guidelines. The school board welcomes public comment. Generally, school board members do not respond to comments during the meetings. If they've not already signed up online, speakers must submit a speaker slip to the clerk before the agenda item they wish to speak on is called. Each speaker may speak for up to two minutes. There is a timer to help you keep track of your time, and speakers should conclude their remarks when the buzzer sounds. All comments should address a matter related to Arlington Public Schools. Speakers should be courteous and address their comments to the entire school board. Speakers are called in the order in which they sign up. If you have written comments, please give them to the clerk. We ask the audience to refrain from applauding as it does take time away from the speakers. And we um, have found that this visual signal um, can, is a nice way to show support and does not take additional time. And thank you for the, the demonstrations by some of our um, longtime attendees. Um, Ms. Elliott, do we have, we, we do have speakers, how many do we have? We have 10 speakers tonight. We have 10, and I believe we have at least one student, and um, while we have many bu busy people in our community, our students we think are the busiest, so we do try to prioritize um, their ability, uh, 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 place in the line. Um, so if uh, you wanna begin. call them first, and then we'll go from there, thank you. Our first speaker and our student is Max Tankersley. My name is Max Tankersley and I'm a junior at Washington Lee High School. I'm working on a service project aimed at improving the standard for mental health education at the national, state, and county levels. Studies show that seeking treatment for a mental illness is often avoid avoided entirely due to stigma. This stigma has led to suicide becoming the third leading cause of death for Americans ages 10 to 24. Studies have also shown that better outcomes result when mental illness is identified and addressed earlier. Properly educating students on mental illness can be life-saving by helping students to identify illness and seek help as well as break down the stigma around it. There is no national, state, or county standard curriculum on mental health education despite its importance. The current system in Virginia requires physical education teachers to address complex mental health issues with minimal training and requires each PE teacher to individually develop their own lesson plans. This approach can do more harm than help when the material is not taught properly. I believe that we can make serious progress on the county level by allocating certified counseling personnel to provide mental health education and setting up a structured program using the existing model of family life education, which has a carefully structured curriculum and resources available for parents. The family life, family life curriculum gives notice to parents before the material is taught in class, giving them the option to discuss sensitive topics with their children before they come up. This curriculum also provides parents the opportunity to opt out if they are concerned with the curriculum as well as review the class material in advance. Mental health education has life-saving potential for students at risk of suicide and other effects of mental illness when it is taught carefully and professionally. And I believe Arlington Public Schools can begin to set a new standard for how mental health education is taught. Thank you. All right, our next speaker is Jim Riel. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for letting me share my experience. Uh, my heart sank the first time I approached and then entered the building that is home to the Stratford program. The entrance was in the back of the building and the classrooms were in the basement. Coming off a very positive experience with APS elementary schools, this was a sign of our new reality. My son, Adam Rio, and our family 
had very good experiences at the elementary schools that Adam attended, Jamestown, Patrick Henry, and Discovery. At each of these schools, we felt welcomed and included from the get-go. Our arrival through the front door with greetings by General Ed and Special Ed faculty and General Ed and Special Ed students set the tone. We were all happy to be there. We felt included. I reminded myself that this arrangement would last one or two years given the construction of the new school. That still felt too long, but it would end, and we were lucky. Parents, students, faculty, and specialists associated with the Stratford program have been coming in the back door and learning and working in the basement for decades. When I learned that the new $100 million Wilson School Design had a segregated entrance for the Stratford program and that the program was located in the basement, my thoughts went to a dark place. A sick feeling of injustice and inequality and the realization that now, for the first time in my life, I could relate at some level with minority groups who've been marginalized and discriminated against and what that feels like. Images of sitting in the back of the bus at a separate Thank lunch counter. Thank you very much. Out of fairness fountain, to all of our speakers, we do have mind. to ask you to conclude. No, and the Thank irony. Out, out of, of fairness the to the speakers, we do have to ask you to conclude. I'm very sorry. Please do conclude your comments. Out of fairness to the next speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you. If you could please conclude your comments. Would you please conclude your comments? I, I do need to ask you to conclude your comments so that others can have the fair fairness of the amount of time they have. Would you please conclude your comments? Sir, I need to ask you to conclude your comments so that others have the same amount of time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Katherine Harris. My name is Katherine Harris, and I'm the mother of two APS students, including an autistic sixth grader at TJ Middle School, whose dream is to become a cartoonist when he grows up. For many months, Arlington's disability community voiced its views about the importance of universal design and inclusion when designing the Wilson Building to meet the needs of all Arlington's children, including students with disabilities. We were assured that our well-founded, deeply held views were heard. I was surprised and disappointed to learn this week that the current design relegates students with disabilities to the basement with a separate entrance. The very first principle of universal design is equitable use. There should, for example, be a common entry to the building. People who require accessible entrances should not be exiled to a remote delivery area as in the current Wilson Building design. The current design for the Wilson Building literally walls off, segregates students of different learning styles and abilities from each other. This is a serious missed opportunity for both students with disabilities and typical students. All of Arlington's students, all of Arlington's children, including its children with disabilities, should be able to access enriching academic and social opportunities the whole time they're in school, not just before they hit middle school. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Brandy Horton. This is my son, Wayne. In this photo, he is showing his truck to fellow first graders at Barrett Elementary School. What you don't see in this picture is lists of co-occurring disorders. You don't hear the silence when his peers ask questions and Wayne doesn't answer because he isn't verbal. This is a picture of a young boy excited about trucks and his peers excited to learn about his favorite toy. This is a photo of inclusion. Barrett does well to make sure that all students spend time together when I am with Wayne at school, I witness other students waving to him and saying hi. 
At Barrett, he is valued. This little boy depends on the community that his school provides, and as a parent, I count on the school system to promote love and acceptance and build confidence in all of its students. The plans for the Wilson Building, which will be his future school if everything continues as it does, with one entrance for general education and one entrance for the Stratford students, they're contrary to what my son needs and they're contrary to what Arlington needs to be a welcoming and inclusive community. We live in an incredibly divisive time and I applaud all of the school board's efforts to ensure that students of color and students from other countries feel safe and welcome in our schools and in our community. But I am horrified that somehow in this effort to unite, students with disabilities have gone overlooked and their parents and advocates have gone, un gone unheeded. Diversity and inclusion are not words. They're not talk or commitments or proximity. They're actions. Arlington Public Schools must take action and stand up for inclusion. A simple change to the school's design plans, ensuring that all entrances are designed for all students is necessary. Separate but equal is no longer. But right now, right here in Arlington, separate but equal seems to be acceptable when we're talking about students with disabilities. No student should be encouraged by words or by design to use one entrance over another. Inclusion is about action, and it starts from the moment the students walk into school together. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tana Szymanski. There seems to be broad consensus that the current design of the Wilson Building is at odds with our community values. H.B. Woodlawn and Stratford families alike are uncomfortable with the idea of students with significant disabilities being further marginalized and stigmatized. APS has said it is impossible to alter the design at this point due to site constraints. So to, what are we to do now? In discussions with dozens of stakeholders, including APS staff, school board members, and Stratford and H.B. families, there seem to be three potential solutions. First, move the entire Stratford program to another location. While not impossible, this option seems difficult due to space constraints everywhere else. Second, move the two MEPA and five functional life skills classrooms that comprise the Stratford program, 50 students total, with their staff intact to different schools around the county. The services, staffing, and IEPs for these students will, would all remain the same. At most, a school would absorb three to eight students, something that seems eminently workable and could be accomplished within the next seven months to avoid Stratford students having to make the temporary and anxiety-provoking move to the Reed Building. Third, move some of the Stratford classes elsewhere and keep a smaller Stratford program on the main level of Wilson. Tweak the design so that the space in the northwest corner of the main level becomes four classrooms ser serving 30 to 40 Stratford students. The administrative, therapy, art, and PE spaces would be on the lower level, but the students would spend the vast majority of their time on the main level, where they would be better integrated into the rest of the building, would have better views on natural light, and could realistically use the main entrances like everyone else. Tomorrow is the 59th anniversary of the day four brave African-American students walked into Stratford Junior High to end the de facto segregation that existed for five years after the US Supreme Court found separate educational facilities unconstitutional. I have great faith that our community will uphold our deeply held values of social justice and civil rights and prevent a different kind of de facto segregation in the most expensive school ever built in Virginia. Let's put our heads together and work to get this right. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kurt Schuler. My daughter is a student at the Stratford program. Uh, as you heard, some people apparently think the design of the Wilson Building is discriminatory towards students with disabilities. My view is quite different. Because the Wilson Building is on a slope, it has separate ground level entrances for different floors. The Stratford students under the current design would mainly use a different entrance from the other students. I don't see that as discriminatory. You know, a number of the Stratford students are in wheelchairs. Uh, it's faster and easier for them to leave the building at a ground level than to enter at another level and take an elevator down. Um, other Stratford students are prone to sensory overload. There are even a couple who tend to run away in a crowd. Uh, and for emergency evacuation, of course, a ground level exit is essential for saving time and perhaps lives. Nor is it discriminatory for the Stratford classrooms to be grouped together. Living in a, or having a concentrated space is in the current location, gives the feeling of an academic home and has helped my daughter be comfortable at school. The Wilson Building has areas where Stratford and H.B. Woodlawn students can participate in shared activities and it, the building has been carefully thought out 
with the principles of universal design in mind to make it accessible to all types of people. My daughter and other students at the Stratford program are there because they benefit substantially from special methods of teaching and care that a regular classroom cannot provide efficiently. I am thankful that Arlington Public Schools understands the need for such a program and I am satisfied after having reviewed it that the design of the Wilson Building will be appropriate for my daughter and for other Stratford students. Thank you. Okay. Our next speaker is Nathan Z. My name is Nathan Z, and I'm the Campbell Elementary PTA president. I'm here tonight to comment on the elementary school planning initiative. I have concerns related to the process and approach for determining the location of the five elementary option schools. For this first phase, it appears the only criteria you're looking at is walk zone density, which is the walk zone and how many kids might walk. This is critical information to have when determining elementary school boundaries. However, identifying locations for option schools involves a lot more than who may walk. Some examples from Campbell. Campbell has an extensive outdoor classroom anchored by wetlands, a pond, and a series of gardens. Our Title I community raised over $50,000 to create the outdoor classroom, and it's thoroughly integrated into the EL model and school curriculum. Campbell's adjacent to Long Branch Nature Center, where we have developed and nurtured a relationship over a number of years. Our kids take dozens of field trips to the Nature Center, and it's integrated into our EL model and school curriculum. Campbell has housed the countywide interlude program for several years. This program's moved from Nottingham to Oak Ridge and is now at Campbell. The kids in this program have special needs, and there are a host of reasons why this program should not move. Diversity at Campbell is a huge strength. All students benefit from this diversity of socioeconomic backgrounds. Campbell's building is old and small. APS has already determined it's not cost effective to add significant capacity to Campbell should this building house a neighborhood school. My point is there's a lot more than walkability to consider when determining locations for the option schools. I don't know the programmatic impacts at the other schools, and more importantly, as the decision makers, neither will you with the current process. Gathering walkability data early and with community input is a very good thing. However, using this data and only this data to make complex school sightings decisions is not the best idea. I know folks are working very hard on this and have good intentions, and I ask you to focus staff's limited resources on the elementary boundaries and not on developing an incomplete recommendation associated with moving option schools. As opposed to a strategic approach, this is more of a tactical approach when only looking at one variable and a multivariable problem. Thank you. Our next speaker is Catherine Novello. Good evening. Um, as a community, we at Campbell were surprised to learn that our program was being considered for a move, given how deeply tied our program and educational model is to our physical setting. Over the past few years, and under the leadership of our amazing principal, committed staff and teachers, and committed parent volunteers, we have strengthened our program, invested in our program financially, physically, and emotionally, and improved our fidelity to the EL model. We hope that you and staff will deeply consider how harmful it would be to our program and to the instruction of our children to move our program to a different location where we'd have to begin again from zero. Gardens don't grow overnight, and not all locations are as uniquely suited to our educational model, which includes frequent walking field trips or field work to the Long Branch Nature Center. And I think of how wasteful, I cringe at how wasteful it would be to abandon the investments that have been made at our current location, such as the wetlands, the extensive outdoor gardens, the outdoor learning spaces like the Courtyard Pond, because it's unclear whether a neighborhood school would have the inclination, the time, or money to fully utilize or even maintain these spaces. And I think as you and staff carefully deliberate, you must ask yourselves whether moving our program, or any program for that matter, might have a deleterious effect on instruction or on a program's fidelity to its educational model. Would such a move create more problems than it solves? Um, it's difficult for our community to give complete feedback when it's unclear whether you're considering a swap with a nearby neighborhood school or whether you're considering moving our program to an entirely different neighborhood altogether. If it's the former, please consider that our school is unique in its size given its age and Campbell could not house anywhere close to the number of neighborhood seats as other area schools without a costly addition, addition which has previously been considered and rejected due to site considerations. And if it's the latter, I would ask you to carefully consider whether um, this would create a unique hardship for current families and prevent us from maintaining the high parental participation our school can currently enjoys. Our community understands that the, the system grows and changes and we must do so too, but please, we ask that you help us change in a way that allows us to continue to thank, invest thank in the Thank you very much. Thank you. thank you. 
Our next speaker is Jean Shim. Good evening. I was disheartened to learn that Arlington County, where I've lived as a resident for the past 16 years, and where I've chosen to raise my family because of the diverse and inclusive nature of its community, would think that having a separate entrance for students who are part of a special needs program at a public school is acceptable, especially in today's divisive environment. Having neighbors with a special needs child whose family has become a second family to ours has taught my kids what it means to be inclusive and non-discriminatory, to be accepting and, to, and loving to those who, who may not be like everyone else. How does it make sense to teach that to our children every day and then have our own community do the exact opposite and build a school that will allow for discrimination and non-inclusion? Especially at an age where ki kids are highly impressionable, you are demonstrating to children that students with a disability are different and should be treated differently by having them enter school through a back door where, be, where they will be missed and not seen. How does this foster inclusion in an, in an accepting environment? Have you tried to explain how a separate entrance is acceptable and inclusive to a nine-year-old? My son wants to know why his friend, who is someone he considers that he looks out for, would, be, would not be able to use the same door that he does. Thank you. Thank you. Our final speaker is Gary Steele. I'm going to pass these out to the board members. As many of you know, a few years ago, we had a rough entrance into special ed at APS. Um, I just finished uh, an IEP meeting. Um, I would say when we entered, APS staff expectations for my son were here, my expectations were here, and where my son is now is here. His special ed teacher believes he has a very good chance of passing the reading SOL this year, which for a boy with Down syndrome is not normally in the cards. I thought he might need an extra year to get there. I know there's been some community feedback about what's going on at Nottingham. I wasn't aware of it. it certainly hasn't been my experience. We have nominated his second grade special ed teacher for teacher of the year. His current special ed teacher, I'm kicking myself because I was too busy at work to nominate him for teacher of the year. Um, the team throughout the whole time has juggled having an abnormal number of kids with IEPs in his grade. So when Orton Gillingham rolled out, we did not have the resources to do his intervention and Orton Gillingham at the same time. So the stuff that was written in the program evaluation years ago about, well, those are the special ed teachers' kids, not mine, that doesn't happen at Nottingham. We have seen teamwork between special ed teachers and classroom teachers juggling a demanding load of kids to the best of their ability. So I honestly, from going to Down syndrome conferences and participating in the local dads group, don't think there's a better place in the area where he could be right now than at Nottingham. So everyone's path is different. But what we have seen is that inclusion for this kid has been amazing and it has been great for his peers. Yesterday, I came home to find that a child whose disability relates to a lack of empathy has found that having this sweet, caring, funny kid in her class has really touched her and she made a pop-up card by hand thanking him for being such a great friend. And his teacher has told me how he brings a positive attitude to the whole class. So thank, thank you. Okay, thank you all very much, very much for coming out. We're gonna like give our visual signal, but thank you, thank you. It was really um, great to hear from everyone. We are gonna go on, um, and we do understand folks may not wanna stay for the rest of our meetings, so, um, uh, yeah, I'm told I just encouraged you all to leave, but you know, if, if, if yeah, anyway, let's go on. Um, we are now going back to where we were on the agenda at one point, which is the superintendent's update on the 2017-2018 action plan. Dr. Murphy. Thank you, Dr. Cannon. Uh, as I regularly do, I bring the uh, series of different activities that we have going on with uh, various projects and initiatives that we're leading this year. Uh, one of them is in group one, and that has to do with new policies and policy revisions. Uh, and more specifically around that, uh, we're talking about um, 
acceptable use, and actually you're going to be taking action on that uh, one part of that this evening. But the other has to do with uh, school facility naming policy and criteria. Linda Ertis, our assistant superintendent for uh, school and community relations, has been leading that effort, and she wants to talk a little bit about where we are uh, in the process. Some of the things we're going to be making available or already have made available uh, to the community to begin to review. Uh, and then set out a little bit more of a, a clear timeline for us in moving forward. So the schedule is adjusting here, uh, but we realize because of multiple things sort of happening simultaneously, we kind of need to pare those uh, back and kind of address them as the needs come forward. So with that, Ms. Ertis, I'll turn the mic over to you to kind of lead us through the next couple of slides regarding the facility naming process. Okay, thank you, Dr. Murphy, and good evening. Um, let me walk you through what we've done and what we're propose, proposing as we move forward. Um, we did online community input form. Um, we've uh, done student focus groups, the community focus groups at SIFAX. Um, we uh, received finally, and we had, as you know, we had the George Mason School for Conflict Analysis and Resolution working with us. We received their report um, really late December, right before when we went on winter break. And so this month we've been looking at it, we've been sharing it with board members, talking about it, and trying to determine what and how to, to move forward to be respectful of the input that we heard from the community, but also not to delay um, other work that needs to take place. I, I did want to share that the two big conclusions that we heard, and, and there's no question that we heard an awful lot about the Washington Lee High School name, either to rename it or to keep the name the same. Um, so that dominated a lot of the conversations and the input, although we did receive input on other issues related to the criteria. What we heard a lot from the Washington Lee community um, was that they wanted more time for discussion. So uh, recognizing that we want to be respectful of the community, but we also have a lot of work that we need to do, we're recommending a one change to the process, but everything else will pretty much stay the same. Let me walk you through what we, it would look like. The next phase, which would be happening this month and next month, would be the staff committee will be developing and finalizing Naming, uh, naming criteria proposal to come to the school board. That work continues on. At the same time, and I was asked earlier today by one of the board members, we will um, go through and we're looking at the, you know, the background of all of the names which we had promised the board so that we can, when we come with the naming criteria, we'll also say, for example, Drew Model School was named after Charles Drew and this is what his background is, just so that you'll have that information as well. So that'll be February and March. In April, our goal is to come to the school board with a draft naming criteria for the board to review and hopefully approve this spring. The reason we want the criteria uh, and need criteria to be um, finalized is that we have four projects that need to be looked at. The new middle school at the Stratford site needs a name besides the new middle school at the Stratford site. We have the neighbor, neighborhood elementary school that will mo be moving into Drew Model School. I don't think anybody's suggesting changing Drew, but the community may want to talk about, is this the name we want? Do we want to change it? Do we want to keep model? Do we want to, you know, whatever that conversation. But I think that's a conversation we want the community to have, and then as part of that, what they'll discuss what they want their school colors to be and mascot and so forth as they transition to a separate neighborhood school. The um, new primary Montessori school at the Henry site needs a name. Um, the name for the building at the Wilson, we keep calling it the Wilson Building Site, but it really doesn't, we know the two programs that will be there, but what's the building being called? So those have to be resolved next fall. The site, um, the, the criteria that you would approve this spring would then be used as we move on uh, this summer Based on the criteria, we would put together and recruit naming committees for those four school projects. 
We'd follow the procedures that are already outlined in our school naming PIP, which identifies how many meetings they need to have, how they should engage the community, and what the makeup of those naming committees should be. With the idea that next fall, the committees, the four committees will convene and work, develop their school name recommendations for the, those building projects, and bring those forward to the board in, by December so that the board can approve the, those school names. What we're asking to do is to pull Washington Lee aside, understanding that the com community has asked for more time. Um, and so we're looking at this summer, uh, because nothing could happen really until the criteria was developed anyways. After um, that's done this summer, to develop and recruit a community ad hoc committee uh, the board will work with the board to develop um, a charge of what the, uh, the committee is to do, including engaging in, in the community and, and community conversations, uh, what the membership makeup should look like, and so forth. And then we would recommend uh, identifying an outside facilitator for this process who understands the cultural sensitivity of the topic. And it would be our preference that it would not be anybody really associated with Arlington County, Washington Lee High School, or any of those groups, but it would really be independent. That group would, uh, once appointed, would work September through November to hold community conversations and meetings about what they felt about the name for Washington Lee. December report or reports to the board, there could be one in favor of keeping the name, one report in favor of changing the name, and there could be a third report, as has been suggested, of a middle ground, uh, some sort of compromise um, idea. It would be the community's conversations and reports. Based on that, then the school board next winter would make a decision on whether or not to keep or change the name for Washington Lee, and if the decision is to keep the name, no further action would be needed, if the decision would be to change the name, then we would initiate a naming process just like we're doing for the other schools um, to rename it with the idea that that name would come into play for the fall of 2020. Um, that's basically um, the main change is Washington Lee. And, and the reason we've set it aside um, different from the others is there's already conversation in the community change or no change. And so we want to recognize the community's request for more time, and, and that can take place while we're moving ahead with the other four buildings. Um, so that's that process. And I'll turn it over to Dr. Murphy. I think that's my last slide. Yes. OK. Thank you, Ms. Hurtis. So continuing on with uh, group one with new policies and policy revisions, uh, we've talked in the past about the various acceptable use policies that we have related to uh, technology and digital, digital citizenship and internet safety. Uh, the group has taken essentially five of the existing policies and combined those into two. This evening you're going to hear the, uh, or take action, you're slated to take action on the filtering and federal guidelines. And I believe uh, Matt Smith is here to update us on that. And then we're going to continue with the second portion of that that has to do with acceptable use. Uh, we've had some community engagement here uh, in the fall. We are bringing uh, this to uh, TCI, also uh, teachers, um, teachers uh, help me with TCI acronym. I'm drawing a blank. Teacher Council on Instruction, Count, teacher council on instruction also uh, to uh, the technology and uh, ACI advisory committees uh, during the month of February and March, and then uh, slated to bring that here to the school board uh, the latter part of March, and then uh, the board to slated to take action. So that's where we are uh, really with uh, group one. With group two uh, and some of the elementary school planning that were underway, uh, the board did have a work session uh, last month uh, to kind of talk about how we move forward with the elementary school planning process. We also had a uh, meeting the other evening that I was able to attend. It was hosted by uh, School and Community Relations and our planning office 
where they began to speak with our ambassadors and many of our PTA leaders. You see the initial communication plan and timeline uh, was posted today on Engage. And what we're looking at is a two-phase process. Uh, the first phase will occur here February through May, uh, and it's really beginning to identify elementary school locations and then a review of some of the walk zones in relationship to neighbor and neighborhood and option schools. And then the second phase to take place uh, in the fall of 2018 around elementary school boundary changes. So we've uh, broken the, uh, this process really into uh, two pieces, uh, and I think the approach and the design that we have really will allow for the community to engage and kind of become aware of the direction that we're moving. When we look at group three uh, with operational uh, plans, uh, we are slated here we, uh, to have uh, a monitoring item uh, on February 15th that's going to address the Arlington facility and student accommodation plan as well as projections and capital utilization. We then are going to bring back in subsequent meetings March 8th for information and March 22nd uh, the CIP framework uh, and so that'll give everyone in the community some time to digest those monitoring report items but then also have the context about how those items then fit with the CIP framework. We've got a work session then for the strategic plan slated for February 6th, and I know that group has been moving forward with its mission, vision, and core values, and thank you also to the community for providing some valuable feedback. I know the uh, committee has taken that to heart, and uh, they are gonna be coming uh, forward with some uh, revisions of their work. And then we will be moving into the budget here with the latter part of February, uh, with um, my presentation of a proposed budget and then the county manager presenting um, his proposed budget uh, on Saturday, February the 24th. That is also uh, the point where the county will advertise also uh, the tax rate uh, and then later in, in the spring uh, set that tax rate. Moving on to uh, group four, which is capital initiatives. Uh, we've got the, the Reed building uh, that is continuing to move forward. Right now, the BLPC and PFRC are looking at um, reviewing traffic and parking requirements. Uh, we also have slated bringing forward the construction manager at risk contract to award that, and then the concept designs, uh, which I know are being out there discussed in the community, uh, will be coming to the board in March. And then we're gonna continue uh, the work here with the Career Center. I know that kicked off uh, just recently. Ms. Talento is our liaison. Uh, to that group from the board. Uh, and so that group is gonna be working February through August. And I, I do wanna report, and this information will be coming out, and I think it's a, a very strong indication I have there about Arlington Tra Tech and the uh, you know, plans for enrollment growth. Um, we had approximately 213 students apply uh, this uh, during this period of time and we're gonna be taking all 213 of those students. So we're really excited about that. It's a combination, by the way, of um, rising ninth graders and rising 10th graders. The vast majority of those students, though, about 107 10th graders. Okay, so there's sort of the balance. Uh, and that is uh, right on projection of where we wanted to be with that program. So. Uh, Thank you to Margaret Chung and her team over there, as well as um, all of our supporting middle schools who got the information out to our students and, and the awareness and the different events that they had. The last one that I had is, uh, has to do with, uh, in this group, has to do with the Education Center. And I'd like to just call on uh, John Chadwick, he's well versed in this, uh, to speak a little bit about uh, where we are with the timeline and how these different pieces kind of fit together. Thank you, Dr. Murphy. Um, I'm not sure what's going on. But... Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, the good news on the Education Center is that we're moving ahead with that. Uh, yesterday, we posted a request for proposal for architecture engineering services on it. Uh, I don't remember the due date. It's usually about a month, and we expect to have that selection made sometime by April uh, to go through the process we normally go through. Um, the BLPC process will start shortly thereafter. We also um, are bringing to you this evening uh, construction management at risk um, determination. 
I'm sorry, that's next week, but we will be shortly bringing to you a construction manager at risk determination for the education center so that we will be able to proceed with that method of procurement, which uh, really helps us on relatively complex projects like this. And um, we will then proceed with a CMR selection process, that's construction manager at risk, and that will probably be completed by some time in June. Uh, that's very important to have very soon after the architect is hired uh, and very soon after the BLPC starts at work, its work because we use the construction manager at risk to provide us with estimates of construction cost, which we balance against the, uh, or we reconcile with the estimates of construction cost provided by the architecture engineering team. So um, we are ready to go ahead with that now. There has been a lot, um, some discussion of the program, and we've had very clear direction from you, which uh, we heartily agree with, to design the building so that it is as adaptable as possible to different programs. Um, and so there is quite, quite about a bit of work that can be done before we have a specific program selection, which we anticipate would come um, sometime after the CIP is selected. Um, as you know, this building uh, has not really had very much done to it in a major way since it was built. Uh, it also, to be used for instructional use, for educational use, we have to essentially gut the building and re-fireproof it so that it meets the fire standards for um, educational use. Uh, we also have single pane glass windows, which of course is clearly no longer acceptable in any sort of a building. And uh, when we opened up the uh, wall in the school board conference room recently, we were somewhat surprised to learn that we had no insulation in the outside wall. So there's a great deal that has to be done to this building. Our bathrooms also uh, are not um, fully accessible, um, and there are some other universal design deficiencies in the building. But there's a great deal of work that can be done um, before the program is selected and we are always mindful that we design our buildings not for a specific program. Uh, we design them to be adaptable so that they're fully adapted to the first program, but they can be adapted to future programs as we see the need. Thank you, Mr. Chadwick. I'll just remind everyone that uh, an excellent resource continues to be our Engage page, and we continue to post information uh, either as uh, decisions are made or more information becomes available. So encouraging folks to continue to uh, check that site. And as you can see, there are, we're coming down the pike here with a lot of decisions and uh, a lot of information as we move into the, the latter part of winter and into the first part of spring. Kind of snowballing, and that just happens to be winter, but, <laughs> but it's really happening. I am guessing we have no speakers. Okay, um, board colleagues, questions and comments for the superintendent, and we'll start on this side, Ms. O'Grady. Thank you, Dr. Murphy and Ms. Erdos for the presentation. Dr. Murphy, on slide three, we, we talked a little bit about on um, the new naming uh, policy, and down where it says new primary Montessori school, I just wanted to clarify for the community because some people who know Montessori might think that we're saying that that's going to be a program primarily for pre-K. Um, I just wanted to ask what grades at this point might be in the building just for clarification purposes. I mean, it's, it's, it's going to be the, a replica yes. of what's at Drew Model School right now th through the pre-K program through grades five. So okay. it'll be primary yeah. and elementary. Yeah. It'll be primary and elementary. Right. Yeah. Okay, right. no worries. I just, right. for people who are looking, I just didn't want yeah. them to be confused. Okay. Um, and, and thank you for uh, the information about the current naming, or the naming criteria for the schools listed there. Um, there was, I, I uh, received some questions uh, from uh, one of the school communities uh, about whether or not the name would have to change or what the feelings were, and I think you addressed some of that. So thank you for clarifying. Great, thank you. Mr. Goldstein? Ms. Van Dorn. Okay, I'm gonna work uh, from the back forward, and mm -hmm. you can, it, it's only gonna take a second. On the Engage page, I, I would suggest 
that we consider having a place on the engage page for the policies, a header of policies with each of the policies that we're considering. We're going to hear from Ms. Burgos about our process for going through policies. And I was at a recent CCPTA meeting where the uh, topic of a transportation policy came up. And at the end of the presentation, people were sort of fumbling around trying to figure out, well, where should I send my comments? I think the Engage page has been a brilliant way for our community to easily remember just where to go, mm -hmm. to provide input on projects that we're working on. And I think it's been of great use to the board to be able to go and review that information and have it collected in one spot. So I'd suggest we do that with tra th for doing transportation policies, whatever policy we're working on, that we that we put those up there so it's basically a one-stop shop for families, which it's become. Right, and I, I know that Ms. Burgos is going to be talking a little bit uh, here in a minute about policies, so I think she's going to address that. We've also had discussions with uh, planning and evaluation and school and community relations about anything that's in motion. We want to make sure that it's um, there and uh, available and a resource to folks. So um, I think uh, one of the, uh, uh, in relationship to the, um, uh, the Education Center, uh, the motion that the board had taken back in November, I know we've populated those items up there as well. So you're not searching for in a variety of different places for uh, various pieces of information. That's great, because that was going to be my, my next question. Uh, the Ed Center piece, it may seem to people that we've spent a lot of time talking about the Career Center and not so much about the Ed Center, and that it may seem as if the timeline has slipped. But um, I went back and reviewed our motion, and we are spot on in relationship to the motion. And I just want to make the community feel sure that we're continuing that process, even though the Career Center process is really much, much more complicated at this point. But uh, in that motion, I'll just uh, make one comment. We said that we were going to key it to the strategic plan decisions, not the CIP. That wasn't the, the motion. So um, I just want to make that that correction, and uh, and I'm glad that we're going to put it up on the Engage page. It wasn't there today, so we just didn't close out that project. But again, that's a great place to go to, and and I wanted to just reiterate for the community that we are on on time on the time frame we we had laid out regarding the Education Center. And thank you for that. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add, which is not part of the slides. Um, the um, availability of this site is a result of us centralizing at the current SIFAX facility, uh, and we're moving forward with a phased approach as we move through March and then through April. So uh, we hope to be, be uh, moved by the first part of May into that facility. We may want to add that up there because yes. it's a move for all of us, and our board meetings are going to be in, different pla in a different place eventually. Eventually. Thank you. Okay, all set. Thank you very much. I really want to um, compliment, compliment Ms. Erdos on the naming policy process. Um, you know, we have been hearing from the community both that there is that there's interest in really discussing this and making sure that we get it right. Also interested in the community that we sort of move it along and what you've laid out does that. It's got dates in there. As Ms. Van Doren pointed out, we're, we keep track of our dates, we hold ourselves accountable, we will move along through that process, but it also gives the community time to participate and weigh in and, and make sure that, that we're hearing, hearing from everyone. So thank you very much. Okay, we will now go on to our action items. So the first item is um, our school board policy review process. Dr. Murphy, is there, are there any updates or a summary before we have a motion? Yes, I'm gonna turn uh, to Ms. Burgos here, our chief of staff. Um, she's gonna just quickly review the discussion that you folks had uh, and the information she passed along to you uh, earlier as part of the information item. And then I think we're ready to move forward with a motion. I know there have also been some additional ideas that she'll share with you as far as getting this information posted on the Engage page and then also around the calendar. But Ms. Burgos, I'll turn to you at this point. Good evening. Good evening. Um, so thank you again for having me come speak for on behalf of the policy review team. Um, just as a refresher, I know I went in great detail a couple of weeks ago um, at the last school board meeting, so I just want to kind of remind everyone where we are and what we're asking for action for this evening. 
um, basically adopting the new num numbering system that we uh, proposed two weeks ago, adopting the new formatting template for school board policies, basically just making everything really uniformed, um, subscribing annually to the VSBA policy service. And I wanted to just um, make a mention that I, I think I may not have emphasized this the last time. The VSBA policy service is really a foundation piece for us and it will be an opportunity for us to customize and make changes to what we feel that we need in Arlington Public Schools. So it won't be adopted or won't take that policy and use it exactly the way that it is. In some cases it may make sense, but in most cases I'm sure that we'll be adding and subtracting and things. So it's really for us to be able to look at policies and add things as well as to see the gaps that we have, maybe some policies that we need to have. So I just wanted to kind of reiterate that um, in this discussion. And then of course, lastly, um, charging the superintendents to develop a calendar, a calendar that we all agree to, and then having a, um, a school board annual meeting calendar update, a biannual update, where we would look at the calendar, make any adjustments and changes based on need or code changes and things like that. So um, that's basically what we want to have action on tonight. I also want to address Ms. Van Doren's question about the engage page. We actually had plans to do that. Um, we talked about that at the policy review team because we do want to make sure that people are aware of the policies that are in progress so people can keep track of them and also when we are talking to our stakeholder groups that they also have a place to go and also direct other people if they want to get some feedback from other places. In addition, um, we are also building an internal policy review tree which Melanie has been very, very um, integral on the school board clerk. Um, we are building that system and having a training in a couple of weeks with board docs so that internally as well we'll be able to see all the policies that are in progress and have a really good system so that we see the tracking of them. So internally and externally people will be able to see both the um, sort of the trajectory of those policies. So that's about it. Any Excellent. questions? Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And Ms. Elliott, I think um, going forward I'm just going to assume no speakers and you can let me signal if, if I should not skip that question. Uh, so from there, any clarified questions before we go to a motion? Clarifying questions. Mr. Goldstein. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. I went to the Virginia School Board Association's training last week and found out that um, up until now, we had not been subscriber, subscribers to their policy service, but we are now, or we have recent, very recently subscribed. Do you know why we, we had not previously been subscribers? We found in the past that the policies didn't have enough meat. They just weren't meeting the needs, and this was looked at quite a few years ago. Um, and there were varying reasons. I, it was actually before my time. Um, but when we looked at it, um, we felt that the policies were the ones that we were able to see because we can't see the whole suite of policies until we subscribe to the service. But for the ones that we did, we felt that they were um, robust enough and had enough of the information. I think they've done a lot of work on their policies since we originally reviewed them. And I think Dr. Murphy told me that this was something that he, they even looked at when he first came on board in 2009. So it's been a while since, um, since we actually looked at the service and being able to use it. So as soon as we subscribe, we'll get the whole suite of the policies um, once we take once we take action. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yes, a and to clarify, we do not currently subscribe. Right. That's the question on the table, which might be in the motion. Let's see. May I have a motion? <laughs> May I have a motion? Yes, Madam Chair. I move that the school board approve the proposed changes to school board policy review process and formatting guidelines effective February 1st, 2018. These changes include the following adjustments. Adopt new numbering system for school board policies. Adopt new formatting template for school board policies. Subscribe annually to the Virginia School Board Association Policy Service. Charge the superintendent to develop a schedule for policy revisions by spring of 2018. And the school board annual meeting calendar would include a biannual update to the school board on the process and schedule. Is there a second? A second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes, five to zero. Thank That's you very great. much, thank Ms. You. Burgos. Mr. Smith, thank you for your great work. We will go on to our next action item, which is the school calendar, Dr. Murphy. Yes, uh, let me turn to uh, Dr. Christy Murphy, who has led the school calendar process uh, this year again. Um, I might add very successfully, so thank you for that work. Um, I also um, want to make note while Dr. Murphy is going to summarize um, where we are with this. I believe she has one 
uh, small change that she wants to bring to the board's attention and it has to do with scheduling of graduation I believe. yes my favorite topic good evening um, I'm just going to briefly review at the last board meeting we uh, presented to you the 2018-19 school year calendars just for um, those individuals that may not have had the opportunity to review this um, before this evening APS actually has three main calendars we have our main school year calendar um, in which Arlington Community High School Langston High School continuation at HB Woodlawn and the Stratford program have a slightly different calendar but it's still based on the main calendar uh, we have Barcroft Elementary School calendar and then our summer school calendar the rest of the presentation really went over the instructional considerations that we have to take into um, that we have to consider when we're developing the calendar. Um, we thank you, thank you, thank you for allowing us to change our process this year. We had a lot of good feedback, so hopefully we will fine tune it, um, make it even better. What we're asking tonight is that um, you would accept the superintendent's recommendations on the following calendars. This has not changed. The one thing that did change, which was not part of the presentation, it is on the working documents that we submit to board doc, is our high school uh, graduation and our middle school promotion. Um, given this year that we wanted to uh, give the community, including our students, our staff, our families, um, options to choose from, we had to um, put a graduation date um, in place with Constitution Hall. Um, this year, because we waited so late to finalize the calendar, um, we lost our graduation time at Constitution Hall and then had to get it, I think, on like June 14th. So we're there, still gonna graduate Constitution Hall. But from that experience, we made the decision, the high school principals and I, that we would have a set date and we'd work around whatever calendar option was available. Um, once, the, uh, once we were able to finalize and recommend this calendar three, and hopefully you will accept that, um, we were able to reserve um, Thursday, June 20th, which is the day after high school gets out, which is the way it's traditionally been so that our high school teachers can be a part of graduation. So we, we'd really like to um, honor that. Um, in addition, we, this would result in changing middle school promotion. So middle school promotion would be before the students last day, which is, I think, However, this is maybe two days before, um, but that's traditionally been the pattern that middle school promotion is a day before they get out. Excellent. May I have a motion? I move that the board approve the 2018-19 school calendar as presented. Is there a second? Second. Was, did anyone want to discuss before voting? I can't quite tell when you're reaching it. It looks I can't tell if you're like wanting to say something. Or you're just. I have to vote. a comment, but I can. It, I Go ahead. Now before okay. we vote, yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, or a question rather. So, uh, my question is: is I noticed on the calendar that um, when I was reviewing it for this, and, and I had some commentary from community members, that we have one and a half days for parent-teacher conferences in October now, where before it was two. But there's an asterisk that says students will not attend on these days. And so I'm confused as to, is the other half professional learning? Um, in trying to understand what the teacher's role is when we do one and a half days of conference versus two days of conference. So I, I do believe, um, without it in front of me, there is an E at the top that says, it, uh, at the bottom of the grid for that month, it says E, so it's an early release day. Oh, okay, okay. So the students would come, um, depending upon their school bell schedule, they would come in the morning, and then when they leave, the conferences would start in the afternoon. Okay, all right, thank you, I, I appreciate that. So um, I'll probably just be following up on a separate conversation than uh, trying to understand the time demands for our teachers during mm -hmm. parent conferences or mm -hmm. how that works because when I was working parent I took advantage of the times when teachers would offer evening classes when my children were in elementary school um, and so but that that's where I was confused because I I thought the way I read the coding on the work was that those days would be closed so I wasn't exactly sure 
on how that, so, but right. the, it's the, the clear students would leave at around 12, 12, 10, uh, 12, 24, depending upon their bell schedule. Um, and then the teachers would go straight into conferences. Um, but what we actually learned from this process that hopefully we'll continue to look at is that a lot of the elementary teachers say that they have conferences during the whole week and not just on the two days that we've traditionally had the parent-teacher conferences. So okay. All right. That helps. Thank you. I appreciate it. Oh, and then I do have, well, mm -hmm. I'll comment after because it's related to calendar, but not to this vote. So. Okay. Okay. Motion is on the table. Everyone ready to vote? No, I have a question. You have a question. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead, Mr. Goldstein. Thank you. So, um, correct me if I'm wrong, I think I heard you say um, we were late getting the reservation for graduation at uh, Constitution Hall but we did get it, but it's on a date that's not really in line with where we've been or where we want to be. So tradi traditionally, the high school graduation occurs the day after the high school um, schedule ends for all grades. That way, our high school teachers, because they're still working, have the opportunity to go to graduation and be a part of it. Um, Constitution Hall is becoming much more popular with our surrounding school divisions, so now we are competing um, even more with the other divisions, Falls Church, Fairfax, um, even Montgomery County and Maryland. So therefore, um, we have to kind of get ahead of the game, which is another reason why we wanted to move up our process so that we could um, put our name in and, and have graduation on the days that we would want it. So this year, um, I do believe graduation is on June 14th, but I not all of our teachers would be able to attend because our 9th, 10th, and 11th graders would still be in school. So it would be slightly different for, I think Wakefield goes at seven, um, but for those schools that actually go during the day, it's a little bit more of a challenge. And then the seniors would have to come back to school after graduation? There'd no. be classes after that? No, not for the seniors. I, and I, you have to apologize, and I can always, I have to apologize, and I can always follow up, but I have to have it in front of me to see I don't know the exact date when our high school kids in this year. I don't have that on the top of my head. Okay, but they won't have to come back after graduation, finish up exams or something like that? No. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I misheard. It, high school graduation, it says, is June 20th. Mr. Goldstein was referencing this current school year, the 17-18 year. Oh, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Uh, motion is on the table. Ready to vote. Yes. Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes, five to zero. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Murphy. Ms. Talento, I think she has And Ms. Talento had a comment about... Yeah, so I was actually going to ask what Mr. Goldstein asked, but I knew that it wasn't related to this year's calendar. It was last year, I mean, last, next year's the calendar, this calendar. year's calendar. So it was exactly the clarification, do the seniors have to come back to school when the last day, the exact same thing. So you answered it, so thank you. Okay, all right, thank you. We love graduation. It's not quite time yet, is it? Got a little bit more school to do. Uh, we've got another action item. Uh, and this is to adopt the revisions to the school board policy 45-2, acceptable use of electronic network resources, internet safety. Dr. Murphy. So uh, let me turn to uh, Mr. Matt Smith, and I know Mr. Rajal Samili and both uh, Dr. Natras have also supported him in bringing this forward. I don't think there's any new information, Mr. Smith, but if you might just summarize uh, the information you shared at the last meeting, and then I think the board is ready to move forward with this. Absolutely, um, and as Dr. Murphy actually spoke to this earlier, uh, the desire of the staff is to take the current policy and to split it into two parts. One focused on internet use, aligned with federal requirements, state requirements, content filtering, and the second hide would, but would be what most of us consider acceptable use, which is sort of how the devices are used themselves. And so uh, our recommendation is that the board approve this policy to, to change it and limit our current policy to what's required in the Code of Virginia. Uh, content filtering, prohibited use, uh, and internet safety curriculums, and then there'll be a forthcoming policy uh, around how the device will, devices are actually used. Thank you very much. Let me ask first if there are clarifying questions for Mr. Smith. Hearing none, I think we are ready to act. May I have a motion? Motion? I move we adopt the policy changes in 45-2. Is there a second? 
I second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes five to zero. Thank you very much for your great work. Thank you. All right. So have a nice evening. And our final action item is to approve the summer school updates. Dr. Murphy. Yes, I'm going to turn to uh, Dr. Natras for our update. Uh, she brought a revised uh, summer school calendar uh, that was driven by a time schedule coupled with program offerings, which I think is, uh, looks very, very promising and we're very excited about it. So Dr. Natras, if you could just kind of review those again, I think what is slated here is really providing students with more opportunities and choices. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so as Dr. Murphy stated, I did come to you a couple of weeks ago asking for two elements of board action related to summer school. One was to reduce the Career Center enrichment fee from $518 to $280 to align with our other two-week enrichment programs, as well as to do some shifting of the calendar. Our goal really is to increase learning opportunities for our elementary students, give them a variety of options throughout the summer while providing at least the same amount, if not an increased amount of instructional time. We are also able to offer breakfast and lunch with this shift and a lot of other positive things. So these were the two elements that I brought forward. Just to remind you, this is what the calendar will look like. You see the strengthening programs all listed at the top, and then the various enrichment programs that would be offered throughout the course of the summer. And then we had this, shift to try to show what we are actually approving in terms of the calendar for the last day of elementary. Remember, this is only an elementary shift in the calendar. Middle and high school are staying as they were when approved um, earlier. So that's all I have. If you have okay. any questions, Excellent. I will take Any them clarifying now. questions? Let's, let's just take a moment and let board members decide if there are any clarifying questions. Excellent. We are now ready to act on this item. May I have a motion? I'd like to move that the board approve the changes to the summer school fees and schedule as presented. Is there a second? Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes five to zero. Thank you very much, Thank Dr. Natras. <laughs> okay, we're, we're going to go to board comment. Okay. Can I say something? Though we did approve the motion. Yeah, so. okay. Um, so um, I saw a comment from a parent about um, shortening the time uh, that we're providing for um, summer school from mm -hmm. five weeks to four weeks and how that plays into the parent organizing um, summer activities for the child. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, of course, requires parents, especially parents of uh, elementary kids, to provide more, find something else, some kind of uh, other program, Parks and Rec, mm -hmm. APS, uh, you know, private um, daycare, something like that. And um, the suggestion was that we, we try real hard to communicate that there is a change this year. Mm -hmm. uh, that we've gone from five weeks to four weeks because not everybody you know, pays rapt attention to it when it's happening right. on February 1st for something that's Correct. going to affect them in July and August. Mm -hmm. So I would request that, we're, that we be able to do that, um, try and yep. work real hard to get that word out. Yeah. So a couple of things about that. One, we um, worked really hard last year as well as this year to get our catalog out at the same time Parks and Rec is getting theirs out so that parents see it all in one place, right? I can now um, lay out the APS summer school calendar next to the Parks and Rec and say, all right, I'm going to do these two weeks of Summer Laureate, then I'm going to do two weeks with Parks and Rec, and then I'm going to do two weeks of Young Scholars. I also do want to clarify that for some of our families, we're actually expanding from five weeks to six if they're doing Young Scholars. So that is an option um, for some of our families. That one is a little bit um, different. So we will, I talked to Ms. Ertis this afternoon about after the catalog goes out and when we do the school talk message, to put some key bullet points in there that say, please note some shifts to the elementary calendar here are the new offerings this year to try to bring that to folks' attention. But our hope is that because it's coming out at the same time as Parks and Rec, that families will be able to look at them together and make decisions for summer. 
And, and my understanding is that as a result of tonight's vote, just now, that you'll be going to the print, you'll be starting printing tomorrow. It will be online tomorrow. We had to wait online. to post. Yes, it'll be posted, and then the print versions will go out uh, next week, I believe. They should be at the printer. We didn't want to assume, so we waited, but everything will be posted tomorrow. And the corresponding Parks and Rec information is online tomorrow also, or they we're usually, waiting for the printed? No, Parks and Rec usually publishes end of January, early February, which is why we were trying to do the same. I haven't actually looked at their website to see if it's up yet. Does anyone they know? Also, they also will be at the Summer Activities Fair, and they always have their schedule there. So I believe we'll also have summer school yes. um, staff at summer activities fair mm -hmm. for families who want to look at the, the programs there. And when do we expect the printed version will be? Of available? our catalog? Yeah. Should be available by next week. So for summer activities fair. Hopefully, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, but we also, if it's not, have key talking points, particularly around the schedule, that we'll be able to hand out as flyers if the full piece isn't there. So. Okay, thank you. Okay, yep. Excellent. Great work, everyone. Okay, we are now at our two information items. And the first is the Construction Contract Award for Randolph Modernization. Dr. Murphy. Yes, I'm going to turn to uh, Mr. Chadwick for this and also Ms. Peterson. Uh, Mr. Chadwick will walk us through kind of the construction portion of this contract, and then Ms. Peterson will talk a little bit about the finances. Thank you. So uh, we're glad to... We're really glad, good evening. We're really glad to be um, moving forward on the Randolph um, modernization project. This um, is to, uh, this, the scope of work in this includes HVAC, electrical and lighting infrastructure replacement. Because the amount of work we're going to be doing in f two phases, one this summer and one next summer, and I believe there is going to be some, there's some other ongoing projects through MCMM that will be done before and after uh, during that period. So the work that we're awarding the contract for is for those two summers, uh, for both uh, this coming summer and then the summer of 2019. We only received one bid, we're not quite sure why, but I think it probably reflects the amount of work and in the area uh, and the, um, we were delighted to find that it came in underneath uh, the final estimated construction cost, which had been $5.7 million. Because of these favorable bids, we were able to accept eight bid alternates, which increased the overall project scope and value. Um, and even with those, we're still substantially under the total amount. The alternates included uh, electrical switch, switch gear and some lighting replacement and a couple of other things as well. The proposed budget is the hard construction cost. That's the amount of the contract award. And I'm going to let Ms. Peterson do the rest of this. And she's much better with numbers than I am. The total project cost is about $6.2 million. And as you can see, the hard, con hard construction costs are at 4.7, which is under our estimate. And then we have soft costs of about $1.5 million to make up that total. In our 2017-2026 CIP, we had identified funding for HVAC roofing and infrastructure projects. Um, we have about $12.5 million available from those bond funds, and we propose using those bond funds uh, to fund this project. Of course, $6.2 million for this project leaves other funding available for other projects as well. So the um, recommendation is to award the construction contract to Shapiro and Duncan for $4,744,000 to approve the proposed total project budget of $6.2 million and to approve use of available HVAC roofing and infrastructure bonds to fully fund the project. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's go to any board questions or comments. Mr. Goldstein. Thank you. Um, c can you help me again with the numbers? Um, you estimated construction to be 5.7, but in reality the bid came in below that at 4 point something, 4.7? Uh, yes, it, c it came in a little bit under 4.7, and we had, b we had included a number of alternates that we could accept or not accept. So 
the 4,744,000 includes those ultimates. Oh, okay. That were not um, They weren't considered expected. absolutely essential. They were what we wanted to do as well, but we were obviously managing the funds carefully to make sure we could do what was absolutely necessary. And so they weren't anticipated or, or um, bid? No, they were bid. Oh, they were. So the way we bid this type of contract where we're not entirely sure, well, we're never entirely sure how much it's going to cost, um, we put the basic work as a basic contract, uh, and they give us a number for that. And then on the bid form, they're required to provide prices for, uh, in this case, I think it was six alternates that we could accept if we wanted to or not accept. And we could accept them individually or all together as we have done in this case. It, but you, you actually accepted eight. Oh, did we say eight? Yes, then it's eight that eight. we accepted. Okay. I'm sorry, it, it, I, I, left the, I have a cheat sheet, but I left it at my, uh, over there. Did we say eight? Yes. Yes, so then we accepted eight. Okay. Um, and my other question was, oh, can you just give us a little brief overview of the timeline? So something's going to be done this summer. Yes, so um, the, with HVAC replacement projects, you, the real issue is you've got to keep the building going the whole time. So a certain amount of the HVAC replacement will be done this summer. And that's also linked to lead times of big pieces of equipment and so on. And then the remainder will be done next summer. But the building will fully function all the way through. Um, okay, and uh, when it's done, I mean, right now there's those um, room units that fail and leak and stuff like that. Is it going to be the same technology? It's a, or? Simil it's a similar system uh, okay. with newer because one of the issues that we have in that building is it has really low ceilings, so it's hard to, to, uh, to send pushed air around the building so much. Okay, so thank yes, you. Yes, it will be similar, but they'll be newer and they'll be much more efficient than the previous ones and quieter. Okay, thank you. Okay. And we have one more item this evening, which is the Construction Manager at Risk Contract Award for the new elementary school at Reed. Dr. Murphy. Yes, um, I'll turn here to Mr. Jeff Chambers, who will uh, bring this item. This was part of my superintendent's action update, so uh, these pieces are beginning to fall into place. So Mr. Chambers, turn to you, sir. Good evening. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to present this information item on the construction manager at risk uh, for the new elementary at Reed. And the reason we're bringing it this time, we're still in uh, concept, and why are we bringing the contractor on? It's because we need their input. They're going to give us pricing and other input on the conceptual design that will be being brought to you very shortly. Um, as far as a project overview, uh, this project was included in the 2017-26 uh, CIP, uh, and the project is to uh, create a new elementary school with at least 725 seats um, for the 21-22 school year and at the uh, maximum uh, cost of $49 million. Uh, we are currently in the conceptual design phase, which you'll be seeing shortly um, as the BLPC and PFRC uh, have been working through that. Um, this is a construction manager at risk uh, project. Um, and as you may remember, on September, uh, in September, uh, the board did act to approve the CMR pr procurement method uh, and direct the staff to do the selection process. So this is about the selection process. Uh, and there are two parts of the CMR services. One is the pre-construction services and then following that and getting a guaranteed maximum price is the construction services. So it's a two-part approval that you will have uh, for this um, process. Um, the CMR team selection um, for this uh, prop, uh, process was competitive negotiations um, using multi-phase uh, process, which included an RFQ, qu re request for qual qualifications first, followed by a request for proposal. Um, and there were multiple people involved in the selection process from APS staff, uh, from teaching and learning, uh, from finance and management, and from facilities and operations. And um, we had a very good response to this. We had 10 responses for the uh, qualifications portion. That was reduced down to uh, five firms that were pre-qualified to submit an RFP. All five did submit, 
Three firms uh, were selected to be interviewed. Uh, and then after um, negotiations with the top two firms, the firm has, uh, the, the uh, committee, uh, determined one firm to be the most qualified. So the recommendation from the committee is to approve the contract award for phase one uh, would, for the pre-construction services in the amount of $436,659 to Gilbane Building Company. Uh, and if you'll remember, Bill Gilbane is also currently the CMR for the new school at Wilson. Okay, uh, board colleagues, any questions or comments? Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Chambers. Mm -hmm. And um, with that, we will go on to new business. Does anyone have any new business? And hearing none, we will adjourn. Well, 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 oh. Let's say There's happy birthday to Ms. Talento. Oh. <laughs> caught, you caught it before the gavel. We can cut the All camera. Right, it's okay to adjourn. <laughs> So she it's buys us drinks. No. Yeah. Okay. All right. Does this end up on Soft the video drinks. that's preserved Soft for posterity? Soft drinks. Okay, everyone. Let's <laughs> let's go. Okay. Happy birthday to you. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Tom. Happy birthday to you. Thank you very much. That was very speech. kind. That was very speech, kind. or shall we adjourn? We can adjourn that. Okay. <laughs> we, are, we are adjourned.